Okay. Hello and good morning, everyone. Hope I'm coming through. So excuse a little delay. These uh, hybrid meetings tend to take a little bit of a toll because we're not only going through this hall, but we're also on Zoom where people can have a chance to interact. And we're also live for YouTube for everyone else who wants to uh, see what this action is all about and to see the lovely presentation from our keynote. So first of all, I want to welcome you to the nice Mediterranean environment, getting really warm these days, and it's going to be even warmer. And also for tonight, the forecast is really nice. So anyone joining us for dinner, you should have a really nice view and a nice summer evening. Um, welcome to entering you. So um, I'll tell you a little bit more about us later because I am actually the fourth presenter here to tell you a bit more about the building. Um, but first, just a little bit of housekeeping. So since you're a big group, I am actually obliged to firstly tell you where the fire exits are, which is really important. It's quite simple, since because you've all come in for the main entrance, basically follow the thing back. So here's the main exit door, down the stairs, and out you go. Hopefully this is never going to be necessary, but just as a precaution. So second thing is that today is very, very busy, and the conference part is jam-packed. So we have four keynotes. I will be the time buffer in case our first three presenters actually go a little bit over time. So I'm going to squeeze mine in the end. But the point of our last presentation is that you quickly see how the building was made and then you get the chance to see it. So in your bags, you have little floor plans of the ground floor where the laboratories are marked. So you will be free to roam around um, as you wish through different laboratories. So the hyperspectral imaging is gonna be closed off because it's super small and it's really gonna be hard to cram any of you in there. But feel free to go around. You're gonna have 10 minutes to change the laboratory. There's people waiting in individual laboratories. They're gonna give you a little lecture on what the laboratories are about. So five minutes and you're gonna have three minutes for questions. And then you have two minutes to change the lab. So it's, it's a big building. We have 10 laboratories. So four are, let's say, all for your access where you can go in. So acoustic, material testing, characterization, microscopy, oh, sorry, five, and the composite laboratory as well. So after that, or if you don't even want to go see the labs, you are free to roam the upper part of the building however you like. So these are mostly offices. Um, those that are off limits are closed anyway, but um, you can pretty much walk around as much as you want. So after the first two lectures, we're going to have a short coffee break. Coffee is going to be served outside. It's going to be really short because, again, we are packed on time, about 15 to 20 minutes to stretch our legs. Um, if anyone's warm, uh, the technician's coming in to crank up the cooling because there's quite a few of you in here. So we're going to have to give it a little bit more of juice. Um, so after that, so the last lab tour, building tour, uh, we have the lunch break for an hour, which is also going to be held here. And after that, we have this one hour plenary meeting. So why that was actually moved in front is because we also have members from overseas, um, mostly Canada, and we would like those people to see what the action is say, all about and what we're um, doing on the action. So because they have a time difference, we postpone that to, let's say, two yeah. Um, welcome again. Hopefully you're going to have a nice day of lectures and then hopefully you're also going to have a very fruitful uh, afternoon and then tomorrow morning of workshops. So you're going to be split into several subgroups. So the world group leaders are going to tell you where you can go. We've arranged tables all across the building in different halls. Again, this hybrid thing is a little bit of a problem, but hopefully you're going to be able to manage. Um, and before I finish, also a warm welcome to everyone who's online. Uh, our action has more than 225 members already. So we start at the end of October and we're growing very rapidly. So the selection process on who can be invited here was very, very, very difficult. I apologize to everyone who didn't have the chance to come this time. So the action is still going on for more than three and a half years. Um, all the active members are going to have a chance to be present at some meetings as well. So I'll tell you a little bit more on what we're up to um, after lunch. And for the time being, I wish you nice lectures, learn a lot. Um, and um, I will pass my microphone to our first speaker. And that is Fernando Perez. 
he's going to tell you about the Joker building. All the three is going to tell you about him. Hello, good morning. Can you hear me, everyone? Okay. Good morning, everyone. So, um, welcome again to this uh, conference. Good morning in this very uh, beautiful day in the in the Mediterranean coast. I am Fernando Perez. Uh, I work for Smith and World War Engineers. Uh, we are a civil and structural engineers, a small firm of civil and structural engineers in Cambridge, the UK. Uh, and I am uh, going to talk to you today about uh, a seven-story uh, CLT building from, um, from, from different point of view. Firstly, I'm going to talk to you about 10, 15 minutes about uh, the design phase. Um, which I will involve directly. And then I'm going to pass on the button to um, the research field uh, because this project after completion was part of the Dyna TTV uh, research project that you may or may not have heard about it. Just Google it after the conference. And uh, where um, different um, researchers from Exeter University, Alexander Pavit here with us today, and did some forced testing on the building uh, after after completion and uh, from the university of ljubljana uh, blast uh, did some uh, updated um, modeling 3d modeling of the building but before all that um, very interesting research uh, side of the of the talk i'm going to go back to the first part of the of the design and uh, this is a timeline in the in the project and it's still going because we haven't quite finished yet 2022 or the dyna ttv action um, i'm going to focus on the yellow bit which is the design phase uh, where we uh, smith and Walworth, had to uh, design this building and uh, on my part of the talk i am going to focus on briefly on four things um, why this building and who is the client and uh, why this, this solution. The design challenges with the and the drivers of the design within that solution. Thirdly, I'm going to be a bit more specific and start talking about lateral movements, introducing the topic of lateral vibrations. And then I'm going to finish with uh, what we did during design uh, to take into consideration uh, lateral vibrations and their service wind loads for these seven stories. Uh, I don't think I have said whole timber yet so i don't think i will say it it's a seven story clt building so let's start client who is the client uh, the client is uh, this building is, is, is in scotland is in glasgow the client is uh, ccg osm osm stands for off-site manufacturing uh, OS, uh, ccg osm have a really big factory uh, where they produce their buildings uh, and then they install it on site they are all timber frame assemblies and their typical buildings range from three, four, up to five stories in, in timber frame. They are residential buildings and they have, for robustness, they have the cores, the common areas. They typically do them in block and, and precast uh, slabs, a heavy construction that slows down the construction process. And um, yeah, and it doesn't go very well with offsite manufacturing, just people just laying blocks there. Um, therefore, the aim of, uh, of the company was to explore CLT. This was back in 2015 um, to explore the CLT to try to increase the heights. Uh, always aiming for their their key market in in Glasgow in Scotland, which is uh, housing for everyone, affordable housing. This is not um, high end buildings, laboratories, or these are affordable residential housings for everyone. Therefore, they came to us uh, because at that time there weren't. Uh, they, well, they said there weren't many. Uh, structural engineers that were able to deal with uh, CLT in the in Scotland. So they came to us, although we are in England uh, and we are not certified to practice in Scotland. So we had to have all our designs checked 
there is a certification process for the people for the structural engineers working in Scotland, by which they have to be certified like the, I think there is a similar process in the USA. So we are Smith and Walworth engineers, very briefly, who are we? Um, uh, we, we design any, any, with any type of construction material, but we tend to specialize on high bespoke, uh, well, highly bespoke um, timber and, and complex buildings. Two examples, this is a, a student accommodation for King's College, these passive house buildings. Uh, sitting on uh, insulated rafts, is floating rafts. They are floating on insulation. There is no direct content through the structure. And this one is the uh, one that we recently completed, the Motlin Library, uh, College Library, new library on Cambridge with a uh, exposed Swiss uh, glue and beams and Austrian CLT um, supported by handcrafted, uh, handmade um, bricks from York's, York's art. So that's what typically, no, that's what we tend to do in our daily jobs. But Let's go back to the Yorker building. This was uh, one of the few uh, buildings that was actually driven by structural design. Uh, the company, the, the, the main contractor and client, which is CCG OSM, wanted to uh, get an efficient design to make sure that they were able to adhere to the, to the budget constraints for this type of buildings. Therefore, this time, the architect uh, listened a lot to us, <laughs> actually. And, and as, you, as you can see, I am showing you there uh, the first uh, sketch, the structural sketch. Um, and this picture below is a picture of uh, ground floor walls and the first floor slab. Uh, and it resembles very well. I mean, if you imagine it turned upside down. Um, so part of the team of designers, we were the designers of the superstructure, as I said. Uh, Mass architects collaborating, uh, well, leading the design from the architectural point of view. SBA were the local engineers doing the civil engineering and the checking on our, on our design. And um, Edinburgh Napier University uh, did the acoustic uh, design for, for this building. In terms of design challenges and um, key drivers, uh, well, some of the, well, the main key driver was, uh, as I was saying, efficiency on material use, efficiency on structural design. Um, and uh, Back then, one of the few references that we had was the groundbreaking uh, building that you all have heard about, the, the Murray Group uh, in London, the nine story, it's eight stories of, of CLT. And um, at the end of the, of the design, we were able to achieve uh, an efficiency on the use of the material of uh, 0 0.29 uh, cubic meters of CLT per square meters of GIA. That's a way we have in our office to, to define the efficiency of, of our structures. Uh, it's, it's, it's pure CLT, there are no concrete cores, there are no steel bracing elements, it's pure CLT building. Uh, and this compares to uh, what 10 years ago was a groundbreaking building of 0 0.39. So I think we did reasonably well on, on that point. Uh, how did we, how were we able to keep to 0 0.29? Well, and, and, and deliver an, an efficient, a simple building. Well, we strive to achieve the building solutions with the standard forms of construction. Trying very hard to, well, no, we set out all the floors as, as simple, uh, standard platform floor construction. We design out any requirement for reinforcement perpendicular to the grain on the different slabs to um, speed up the construction process. Uh, and we use lightweight internal and external finishes. Internally, this is an architectural build-up, is a, yeah, dry floors, no screeds. Uh, in the corridor, there, are, there, there is wet screed, but typically in the flats, it's just lightweight finishes. And uh, also the facade is a brick clad. So it's just brick clad, it's fixed to the, to the facade, very lightweight. Other design challenges, which I could do talks on their own, but I'm really just really going to skip to that. Um, but I just put this slide here to just come back to the fact that we're just a structural engineers. In a few months, we had to resolve many things such as uh, robustness, or it was uh, called disproportionate collapse in the, in the UK, movement and tolerances of the timber structures and all those platform uh, floors was a key issue. Fire, I'm sure many in this room uh, know why fire is an, is an issue. Uh, and acoustic performance as well. And that's why we are all here, I think, uh, to talk about in general, all these topics, but I'm going to skip through all of that and maybe we can do other talks the other day about these things. And I'm going to focus a bit more on 
the lateral stability and the sway to lead to the to the lateral uh, vibrations on servile load. So briefly, this is as I was more or less hinting with the previous sketches. This is the typical ground floor, and that's an isometric. Every wall that could be a CLT wall is a CLT wall, and it's a it's a sheer sheer wall uh, construction. We took the maximum benefit of all the panels having pre-cut uh, openings to get extra stiffness and on on all the walls that we cool, uh, and and this is the T-shaped form of of the building. In terms of a few numbers, uh, the lateral stability under the SLS wind load, um, doing our simplified models, um, very different to the blast models that he's going to talk about in later on, on these 3D models, doing our simplified modeling during design, uh, allocating different stiffness to different walls uh, with, with or without uh, openings, including also elastic compression parallel to the, to the grain, perpendicular to the grain. Uh, in the slabs or and also the tension uplift on, on the connections. We managed to achieve a height over 760 on the weakest axis um, for that lateral deflection under 50 year return period win. And now we got to the point of the talk. What where what were back then in 2015 the checks that we did for a seven for a seven story CLT building for lateral vibration under service wind load conditions? This was that's as many checks as we did in the initial design. And, oh, sorry, I jumped one page. And when we submitted our design to the local engineers uh, and the checking authorities that they did, believe me, they did scrutinize this building because it was the first uh, building in, uh, in Scotland of, of, that, of that size. These are all the comments that we were faced with. Oops. Okay. You pass this slide. This was all the comments that we had from all the authorities. Will you pass the slide? Yeah, I can, I can, I can do it now. Great, thanks. Sorry. Luckily, luckily, uh, we didn't stop there. <laughs> we were, we were lucky enough that we were at that time working in the office on uh, on some uh, concept designs. Uh, with the University of Cambridge and PLP architecture, uh, exploring the limitations on on on, on timber and uh, the timber used for for a 300 meter skyscraper that you may have seen as well in the news. This was a uh, a research exercise that we did with the University of Cambridge to understand the limits of timber. And clearly, one of the limits of timber at those heights are are service uh, lateral vibrations. We also knew that because of our work with PLP architecture on a, on a feasibility study for a to tower uh, somewhere in the Netherlands, uh, which was 125 meters, we tried to design a, a timber tower of feasibility studies. And, and we also realized that not only we had to uh, add weight to our lightweight structure to, to come back, with, to, 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 to tackle these lateral vibrations. So we thought, well, why don't we run a nice calculation for Joker? Ah, sure, it can. It will be fine. And it's a seven story. So this was what happened. We initially ran that calculation for Joker, and we were here two and a half hertz. That's the dotted line. Two and a half hertz natural frequency, uh, and a point fifty eight. I was. I think it was from memory. So strictly speaking, we were out. So we thought, ooh, well, maybe it's uh, one of the few times we have done this calculation. Maybe we're not that accurate. So we talked to Thomas Reynold. We are, who I think is maybe online, but he, I think he's part of this course action group as well. He was about to leave uh, Cambridge University to Edinburgh University, and he said, okay, well, I'd like to do some ambient vibration testing on, on there. And from the ambient vibration testing that we did during, during construction by Thomas Reynold, he managed to tell us that our building was actually closer to three hertz, which then were, was validated by, by this, uh, the research that we have done. So that just puts the Wars flat, well, the top floor, some of the flats of the top floor, just in the line that passes the acceptability criteria. So we could sleep at night. Uh, and then a couple of years after the construction finished, for some um, coincidental uh, 
well, I don't know how we end up meeting Alex uh, from the University of Exeter. Um, he proposed that we should join a, a forest value research group with, uh, on lead, led by RICE um, to, to test the vibration, the dynamic response on tall timber buildings and their service load. And this is where Blas and Alex, who are going to talk now about this research, uh, came into, into this mix. So I will pass it on to Alex now. Okay. Do we hear each other? Hear well? Yeah. Okay. That's the first time carrying the mic. Um, where's the camera for for online? Here. Okay. Um, yeah, maybe I'll need that too. Right. So um, there are some familiar faces. Some of you know me already. Some of you we've met yesterday, but for others, I'm Blash Kuren. And I'm doing my PhD on this building, on Yoker. Um, where do we go forward? Ah, here. Yeah. So before we move on to experiments um, that will be presented by Alex, I first would like to explain a little bit about how 3D model has been made. We wanted to have a good um, prediction of what are the dynamic properties, what are mode shapes, what are frequencies, before we went on with experiments, because we wanted to set up experiments properly. And um, we tried to do a finite element model that would be as detailed as possible. And of course, um, this is because this is CLT building, we use shell finite elements for that. And when we try to go as in detail as possible, we model <clears throat> all openings there are, try to go in as much detail. Um, there is 90% of the walls in this building that are load bearing. So we modeled all of that. Um, we neglected the partition walls. This is only 6% of all the walls in the building. And we also neglected steel beams but there is only one percent in total of mass that are steel beams those are only for local reinforcement under floor slabs uh, we also neglected facade screed uh, stairs but only when modeling entities with stiffness we included those element of elements of course in um, calculation of mass and those that are not um, this mass that is not provided with density, we then um, distribute it over each floor. And then there are some assumptions that we have made. And uh, the first assumption is that the foundation is rigid. So that's because, I mean, there is a lot of uncertainty in, in the foundation we did explore foundation as well. In later stages, we did try to, to model different ways. But for the initial model, we model it rigidly. The second assumption is that floor slabs are considered as deformable. Very often, there would be an, an assumption of rigid diaphragm, but we did not adopt this uh, assumption. And later on, you will see why this was useful for us. The next assumption was that connections are modeled as rigid. So this is the platform frame approach that is um, that is uh, was used for constructing this building. So this means uh, wall, floor, wall. And what we did here is we extended shell elements um, of the walls so they they are connected directly and the floor slab is then connected to the side and here all the connections are modeled as rigid um, and later on in slider two i will also present an interesting effect maybe um, 
well, you're all familiar with this field. Maybe this is something that is not new to you, but it was a surprise for me. Um, but first, let's go to material properties. Mm, you all know, of course, the timber is orthotropic material. And there are different sources where we got our values. But at the end, we decided to, to take um, the values from the producer, Stora Enso. Though there was a quite surprise for me that we got shear modulus, the value for shear modulus in standard EN338, that is 50% higher than the one um, provided by producer. Um, because, of course, shear modulus is one of the most important, if not the most important parameter uh, when modeling stiffness. Mm. If some of you know why there is such an uncertainty, maybe we can discuss at the end. It would be very interesting for me. Um, and now to, to the effect that I was talking about that surprised me. Mm. So if you know that timber is orthotropic material and that it has roughly 30 times higher stiffness in the direction of fibers, then when you look at this case, and if you consider a case of vertically loaded um, assembly like that, then you might imagine that when compressing it together, because of this part being quite compliant, would be squeezed between two walls. And when, so this is what would happen. And even though that this dimension, this thickness is not very large relatively to the height of the wall, because of uh, low stiffness, you get the formations that are comparable to, to those of walls. So with our assumption that we just connect wall directly to wall, we make an error. We make, in this case, we make structure stiffer. So we wanted to know how much stiffer do we make this structure or what is the equivalent uh, vertical stiffness factor that, that would correct that. So we imagined a simplified case, just, just two rods. And on the left side, you can see this is more closer to, to reality. So you have a stiffer element and you have a more compliant element. And then on, on the right hand, you see what we did with assumption that we just extend uh, shell elements so that they are connected directly wall to wall. And here, so this is the, the stiffer counterpart, counterpart. So we wanted to connect or we wanted to compare the two and find what is the the factor of um, reducing a stiffness, but only in vertical layers, not the whole structure, only those layers that have uh, fibers directed in vertical direction. And we found with these calculations, simplified calculations, um, taking into account um, dimensions that were present in our case in Yoker, Yoker building, and we found that the reduction of elastic modulus in vertical uh, direction is um, from 0 0.5 to 0 0.7. So this was a surprise for me. This comes from geometry. So how, how do we take into account that in, in modeling the complex structure? Because it's not the same, right? This is simplified case, but at the end we have complex structure. Um, and we have tried to, to use um, reduced elastic modulus only for layers that are directed in vertical direction. And at the end, when we compare to experiments, we actually got um, much more decent results. Um, also uh, comparing mode shapes and frequencies that, um, so when comparing with experiments. Um, but in our initial model, we had not used um, this idea. Uh, with the initial model, we got those first six uh, modes. First three, just basic uh, bending torsion. Uh, and more complex torsion bending for the second three. And 
And let me show you one, one more interesting thing. Um, here, so this, what we have shown here are top floor um, floor slabs. And for the first three modes, you see, or um, you can trust me that there are no deformations, in plane deformations. Um, also, sensitivity analysis has shown that there is no influence of shear modulus to, to those modes. But then the second three have pronounced deformations of floor slabs and um, mainly mode four and mode six could not have been achieved with modeling floor slabs as rigid diaphragms. So for this building, it was important if we wanted to accurately match experiments that we use the assumption of deformable floor slabs. So this is um, roughly my part of modeling. And now I would um, give my mic to Alex. It's working. Uh, good morning, everybody. Uh, my name is Alex Pavic. I'm a professor of vibration engineering uh, at the University of Exeter. And um, the reason why uh, I met uh, uh, Fernando all those years ago when we started all of this is uh, because it was becoming obvious that um, timber structures are the future as far as embodied energy is concerned. And it was also in my line of business, which is vibration serviceability, obvious that there is not much known about it. As those blank pages from Fernando's presentation pretty much showed. And uh, <laughs> I spent all my uh, academic career and professional life measuring and testing and measuring and testing, and proving that various assumptions which we make as designers are actually uh, <clears throat> not so good. Sometimes they are good, often they are not good. And by the way, I'm a you know that that was my background. Yeah, I'm a, I'm a normal concrete design kind of structural engineer. That's how I went into vibrations, and then discovered full scale testing as a sort of holy grail of things. So anyway, uh, <coughs> with that short introduction, um, let me show you what we've done on this structure. Uh, and this structure is special structure. Um, it's 1,300 tons. It's the tallest timber building in the UK, made fully of, 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 of CLT and the rest of it. And as far as testing is concerned, it's, um, it's the first time that what you're going to see here was tried ever by humankind. It, we never tried, we never tested with this methodology, which is so-called frequency response function measurements, which is the holy grail and the gold standard in, in dynamic testing, we never tried to test a fully operational building with people in it, with everything in it. But that's what serviceability is all about. Serviceability is not all about testing half-finished buildings. And then serviceability is all about, you know, what's happening day in, day out. And that's why there is no data, because these tests are incredibly uh, complicated and, and uh, <coughs> difficult to carry out. So first we did model testing. Model testing, not model testing, model testing is, uh, is a technology which basically um, we pinched from mechanical and aerospace engineering disciplines. Um, mechan in, in mechanical and aerospace engineering, dynamics is a much bigger problem than in civil engineering. So they're about 50 years ahead of us, or we are 50 years behind them in that sense. And there's all sorts of uh, good stuff that you can actually pick up if you, if you follow uh, what, what they do. Uh, <coughs> this, is the, um, <coughs> this is the building that we actually tested, um, as, as you saw. And 
first problem with practicalities is that we were able to test only the corridor. You know, nothing else. We were not allowed to go into operational flats where humans, where, where you know, you know, so people people lived. So uh, <clears throat> when you're doing this kind of stuff in 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 uh, real life, you just need to adapt nonstop, continuously. Uh, if you want to get any any kind of data out, and that's one of the reasons why, you know, there is there, there is very little data about these things. So what we've done, we we were actually able only to pick up uh, what's what's going on in this area here, and you saw in Blage's presentation, you know, those whole you know sort of a fully swaying modes and the rest of it. Out of all of that, we were able just to measure what's what what was happening in the middle. And immediately you end up with a problem which is called spatial resolution in model testing, whereby you don't have sufficient number of test points to distinguish between what's going on with testing and what's going on with modeling. Uh, but let's see what, what's going to happen at the end. Uh, <clears throat> at the top of the building was our uh, center, data acquisition center and, and, uh, and uh, shakers. And then also we instrumented all these other levels here, uh, <coughs> the other five levels, uh, with uh, this kind of instrumentation, basically accelerometers at two at two corners, uh, hoping that you know we would be able to pick up what what was going on with two orthogonal directions uh, <coughs> uh, during the measurements. And immediately you are hitting the second problem. What's the second problem? How to because we need to pick up data continuously. How are you going to pick up continuously data on six levels? Run cables through an operational building where you have only eight hours to do the testing. That's exactly what we what we had. Trip, trips, hazards, you know, health and safety issues. You can see immediately why it is complicated to do this. We came up with a solution which is basically uh, synchronized uh, wireless synchronized boxes. Um, and I'll show you how that uh, how that looks like. Right. So, <clears throat> what's the what's the point of model testing? The word "model" is, when you say "model" or another another term in English is experimental model analysis. That means you are measuring the force with which you are exciting the structure. Civil engineering structures, for the because they are large, they're not the, they're not easy to excite by a me by a measured force. That's why, you know, if you, if you read papers for the last 70 years, you will read about ambient vibration testing. People put accelerometers and then let mother nature to excite the structure, micro tremors, wind, and the rest of it. This is different ballgame completely. We are measuring input force into the structure, hoping that we will be able to actually excite the structure so we can actually measure the response. And then by measuring input output relationship, uh, we are managing to acquire much better quality of data than anything that ambient vibration testing will uh, provide you with. And that's the beauty of frequency response function measurements, input output relationship, measurement of so-called frequency response function, which you then functions, which you then curve fit and get all the good stuff that you actually need to get. That's why these kinds of measurements are actually quite uh, uh, rare because it's difficult to excite the structure. Uh, what we used uh, to do that, however, were actually uh, two horizontal APS 400 uh, shakers. Um, you will see how, the, how they look like. I mean, it's, it's basically a horizontally moving mass. Each shaker can supply up to about 400 newtons. That's 40 kilos, roughly, you know, horizontal force. And that's all on, on all of that building. And then that puts us to a different... Uh, <coughs> to, to that actually highlights another issue, which is the issue of having sufficient uh, equipment of sufficient quality so that you can actually filter out noise. So we need to combine small force. Rel I mean, so if it's 40 kilo force on a, on, on a six story building, you know, just, just you know, scale, uh, scale wise, it's just horrendous. But if you have good mathematical uh, approach with a lot of averaging, of noise out of the measurements and sufficiently sensitive uh, accelerometers, you can do it, as you will see. <clears throat> so these are APS shakers, these are QA sensors. They can measure one micro G 
uh, acceleration. Um, and these these yellow boxes are the uh, um, yellow boxes which are synchronized to a microsecond and then positioned along the building. And therefore we don't need um, cables to run between the boxes. And that's how it looked in, in, in reality. We started at, uh, when did we start? Eight o'clock? Was it eight o'clock? Eight, nine o'clock, and then finished by, by six in a single day. This whole thing actually happened. <clears throat> this is how the, uh, you know, sort of instrumentation looks like on a, I think, uh, one of the uh, lower levels. We had to be very careful about the cables, tripping hazards, because as I said, you know, there are six flats on each level. So, you know, people uh, needed to be uh, protected from, from various hazards. And this is the data acquisition center at the top of the building. Uh, when people were getting in and out of their flats, they were, uh, they were quite, you know, uh, <coughs> kind and moving around slowly. So it, it, we had a great, uh, great time with, uh, with people there. No problem. Uh, this is a video. Let's see if it's going to start working when I finish this. Ah, here we are. So what we use, we use a random signal, and then we fed exactly the same signal to all three shakers simultaneously. And because of the slight phase shifts in uh, uh, transfer functions of each shaker, you, you know, they don't move uh, completely in sync, but it's a proper random excitation, and therefore uh, <coughs> you know, no problem with, uh, with the theoretical stuff. Okay, so let's see the, let's see the results. Uh, <coughs> We've done averaging, and this is how this is how the FRF actually measured friction response function actually filters out uh, with more and more averages. You see, first it's noisy, and then as you're adding more and more averages, it's filtering out. Uh, first, we put actually shaker in X direction along the uh, the building, um, and um, this is the response in in the same direction, and this is the response in the orthogonal direction. So clearly, the building was twisting. As we were shaking the building in one direction, we were picking up responses in the other direction as well. That's, you know, that, that's pretty clear here. You see, this is the beauty of actually being able, to, uh, <coughs> being able to measure frequency response function because you start understanding how the structure works much better. And then uh, <coughs> these are the final, final set of results. Um, fine, uh, <coughs> we were happy with that. Very clearly, X direction was more excited uh, than, the, the, than the Y direction, the other direction. You know, that's all part of quality assurance, all makes sense. Uh, and then we turn the shakers around. Okay, so <clears throat> that's the process of uh, turning the shakers. Lash is very good at that. Uh, <clears throat> me too. Right, that's me directing the, the crew. There you are, done. Shakers turned around. And then the Y directions uh, testing started. Okay. So that's how the, you know, the, the setup looks like. And then uh, <coughs> this is now the results in, in the other direction. Um, again, it, uh, it does make uh, you know, perfect sense you know, what, what we are getting. And almost like, I mean, it's look, if you look at this frequency response function, it looks perfect actually from the theoretical point of view. You have peaks, that's where the modes are. Then you cross check with phase shifts where you have a hundred, you know, 180 degrees or so phase shift. So it all makes sense. It's a mode. There are, there are three very cl relatively closely spaced modes here between about 2.8 and, uh, and four Hertz. All good, all good stuff. Right, <clears throat> and then we did curve fitting uh, using so-called MIMO, multi-input, multi-output curve fitting methodology, whereby we are curve fitting simultaneously the set of FRFs in, in the X direction and in the Y direction. That's basically two columns of the FRF matrix. The red lines are actually models. The colored lines are the measurements. The closer the red line to the measurement is, the better the model fitting is to the measurement. So as you can see, it's, it's not bad actually. Uh, <clears throat> and now finally, this is why we did it. 
So as you can see, one of the biggest unknowns in, uh, in dynamic testing of structures is really what's going on with dumping. So pay attention to dumping here. Uh, so standard FRF curve fitting gave us a uh, first mode at 2.85 Hertz. Remember Blage is 2.81. So, you know, not bad. Uh, one of the first things that we actually, even during, the, during that day, when Blage came, came to see us and help us, I told him uh, straight away, it was very clear that best engineering judgment modeling that he performed just to get the initial results so we can actually do the testing was actually not bad. It was, it was pretty good in the sense of modeling mass and stiffness because we were picking up these modes you know, quite nice. He didn't know these results when he did the measurement, the, the, you know, the modeling. So that, that was good, uh, but that's mass and stiffness. Pay attention to dumping. 138%, 174%, 2.07%, 2.05%. is a bit on a high side considering multi-story buildings, you know, um, compared to standard reinforced uh, and steel structures. But uh, <coughs> moreover, that's four modes. Look at how the modes look like. You know, one is going in this direction, the other one is going in this direction, and with a little bit of twisting. I mean, they look they look pretty much the same. I mean, so, some of them look like you know, kind of you know, spot the difference between mode one and mode three. That's that's the that's the problem with spatial aliasing, because you don't know what the rest of the building is actually doing. They look like it's doing the same because we are measuring limited number of points, but then the rest of the building may be doing all sorts of other things which you can't see. This is another huge benefit of model of this kind of model testing. Look at this mode, 8.74 Hertz. Look at how ni nicely it's, all, it's almost like a second bending mode. You know when you're gonna measure this in ambient testing? Never, because there is no energy. Wind doesn't have any, it's, it's very difficult to excite the structure to measure anti-symmetric modes. Whereas this testing can actually do that. And then because it's, it's engaging various other joints, you can actually start picking up issues about joint stiffness and the rest of it in the updating. If you try to update uh, <coughs> these, high frequency, these high frequency modes. And that's where Blas really had a big challenge because if you re read papers about updating, they're all about first mode, second mode, third mode, if you're lucky, you know, that's the torsion typically. And that's about it. People can't do anything more because there's no data. So Blash had a challenge <laughs> from us to actually, because we had all these other modes, okay, go on, try to update and see what's, what's gonna happen with these higher modes. Uh, and I think this is the, one of the first attempts to actually try to update higher modes, whereby you know, you're, get, you're engaging much more the model stiffness and uh, you know, joints and the rest of it. Uh, <coughs> this is so-called auto Mac. Auto model assurance criterion calculation. That's basic, that was done just to see if we actually had a reasonable spatial uh, alias, uh, uh, a, a reasonable density of sensors. Uh, and as you can see, it was very easy to mix mode five and mode two because we have a you know high factor here, or mode four and, and mode one. Uh, that's where the similarities. Uh, although we, we measure different frequencies because we don't have good spatial uh, uh, resolution because of spatial alias and we are getting qu quite high correlation. That's that similarity between modes. If the similarity between measured modes is, is great, that means that uh, automatic value is, uh, is high. So we, ju we just have to be aware of these things and that's it. <clears throat> Dumping. Right, one of the beauties is after we did the, 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 mo the uh, uh, ambient, uh, the, the model testing, we were able to actually, we knew exactly where the modes are. So we were able to sinusoidally shake the building so much so that a lady from the fourth floor came and said, uh, oh, you're sloshing my fish tank. Uh, it was okay. I mean, because they, they, they knew, you know, we, 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 were, we were working and uh, the rest of it, but you know, it's, um, uh, <coughs> That, that, that means the structure was properly excited. And these high levels of vibration are probably as high as you can get it in that sense. Uh, 
And then we obviously you run it at a particular frequency, shake a shut down, and then you let it die down the vibration, standard textbooks. And then what we've done, we this kind of plot, what you will see in 99.9% .9 of textbooks, they will give you one single curve. They will tell you dumping is two point whatever percent. Textbooks are saying about this. However, this kind of measurement actually gives you opportunity to do something else. You can actually curve it on a cycle by cycle basis, treating each cycle with different dumping and, and frequency values. Therefore, it gives you an opportunity to do the uh, so-called cycle by cycle curve fitting and investigate amplitude dependent behavior. Now brace yourselves. Ta -da. That's what CLT timber building does as far as dumping is concerned. On a cycle by cycle basis, this first plot shows dumping ratio, let's say for this first mode, and this is the amplitude, acceleration amplitude. We tried it three times, run one, two, three, and then we picked up values as low as 0 0.7 and as high as almost 4%. Which one would you choose when you're designing? Uh, <clears throat> I mean, in 25 years, I'm doing this job. I've never seen this before. I'm using exactly the same methodology, exactly the same technique. In steel and concrete buildings, these lines are pretty much horizontal or with a little bit maybe some kind of going up and down, but there is a very, very clear trend. With a CLT building, you end up with something like this. And this is probably the biggest outcome and finding in this project so far. Uh, <clears throat> and we are finding this kind of measurements with other timber buildings as well. So we know that, so if you take then an average value of all these uh, uh, <clears throat> circles, two, round one, two, three, these are the average values, but the individual values are all over the shop, depending on you know what, what's going on with the dumping. I think it's something to do with connections. It's something to do with the nature of a timber building. Um, but, uh, <clears throat> you know, the jury is out there to decide. And then we did various comparisons of um, uh, cal dump dumping calculations. What is very clear, I mean, leave these things aside, as far as the precise rundown, as we call it, dumping ratios are these numbers here, right? And FRF uh, testing, that's basically uh, various amount, various sort of circle fitting, and uh, CM, CMF, uh, <coughs> these are the, the values. So generally speaking, FRF testing was producing lower levels of dumping than the shake shutdown tests, which is natural because I think of the, uh, <coughs> the levels of excitation were lower as well. And then finally, uh, <coughs> this was not precisely part of uh, uh, Dyna TTB. But we thought that uh, considering that you know we had you know very interesting building, we thought okay let's let's put some accelerometers these wireless accelerometers on top of the building, and see uh, what's going to happen. I have to say this is a work in progress. Uh, I don't uh, I'm not uh, <clears throat> quoting any numbers here. I'm just saying that I think based on what um, we what we what we heard from you know. Uh, from, from users of the building, what we felt ourselves. This is a three hertz building, right? Very lightweight, 20, what, 25, 27 meters tall. Um, it is possible that ISO 10137, International Standards Organization guidelines for vibration serviceability of tall building, which were calibrated for 100 meter plus buildings. And I know this because I actually sat on the committee who wrote the guidance. Uh, I think that the two don't go together. I think with timber buildings, we have an issue of literally uh, because of the low mass and stiffness, wind literally shaking the building uh, rather than building sort of uh, vibrating. Uh, that's my gut feeling uh, based on these sort of initial measurements. Um, we will be, we are current, as we speak, we are acquiring data and then we will see what's, uh, what's going to happen. Uh, it's uh, the jury's out out there. Um, so uh, 
next time when you design a, a CLT building, if your values and your levels are above the ISO guidance, uh, shall I say, don't worry too much. <laughs> um, I think it's just simply not, uh, you know, fit, the guidance is just not fit for purpose, considering what in 2003, 2004, when we wrote it, uh, what we actually, the data that we had then, the CLT building didn't exist then, uh, what, what it was designed for and what it is being used for. One of the big problems with lightweight structures these days, and it's not only timber buildings, it's also floors, is that a lot of existing guidance is based on steel and concrete, and it just doesn't apply to CLT floors, for example. Don't follow any of the existing guidance on, 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 on composite and, and, and uh, concrete floors. So that's that. I, uh, <coughs> do you have any, any questions? Yes. Arkadiusz Kwiecin, Arkadiusz Kwiecin, Krakow University of Technology, Poland. Uh, so thank you very much for all presentations. And I have a few questions. I don't know if, if I have time for that. So first question is to first presenter. Uh, you choose the architecture of the building. Yeah, uh, we are talking about dynamics and, and we are talking about forms of, of, of dynamics yeah so clearly presented from numerical analysis and also from uh, measurements we see torsional modes there are the most dangerous modes uh, for earthquake engineering yeah because as you can see the building uh, is very vulnerable to shaking yeah? in this case especially in earthquake engineering we avoid uh, strongly avoid and don't, don't recommend uh, uh, buildings that are not uh, simple in, in, in cross-section. To avoid, of course, uh, torsional modes. So in this case, did you think about some improvement of building, uh, not, to do, not to have so big influence of, of torsional mode? Yeah, this is the first question. So, um, can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. So, when we designed this uh, this building, uh, we did, at the end we did some estimations of, of, of lateral vibration, but by no means, I mean, I think we are miles away from uh, from being able to have a tool practicing engineers that is um, able to, to to tackle these these issues. And by no means, we did uh, modeling to find the third or fourth mode. So. We did design, we, our aim was to design, if you see the floor plan, design a, a fairly uh, simple plan uh, as much as we could. As engineers, we would like to have square boxes with no windows yeah, and with this and that. But at the end of the day, they, they need windows, they need to have flats and things like that. So this building is resolved as if each of those three different units were independently stable on their own. So yes, they are combined and I think that's where like torsion comes comes in, into play, but mainly I think for me, the main two first modes are quite uh, in first and second direction. So, so and we are lucky enough maybe that uh, it's not a seismic region, Glasgow, and we didn't have to design for that. So correct, I, I agree. The building isn't in the seismic area, but uh, in Scotland there is a lot of wind, so yes. also dynamic excitation yeah. is present. Yeah? Yes, and and the, the frequency as you presented wind. Two and, and, and four hertz, it is in the scope of, of, of the excitation of wind. Uh, the next question is related to the ISO standard. Uh, this is the Chichelsky curve uh, applied to ISO standard by Polish professor from our university. Uh, and you presented that you would like to move on the horizontal uh, stiffness yeah, according to frequency. So, so you try to increase the stiffness of, of, of the building. Did you think about moving on, on the vertical uh, axis? I mean, to reduce the, the response in acceleration by in improving, increasing the damp in the structure. Right, okay, damping. Let's talk about damping first. Damping is important in resonance. Damping is not important out of resonance. The key question here is how much resonance is actually excited at all? Because when I use the word shaking, 
That means grab it and it's not sort of a resonant vibration. That's vibration. Shaking is when, when the force is literally shaking it. If shaking is in question, then it's mass and stiffness which count. Actually, dumping has very little to do. Dumping is only important in a very narrow region around, around resonance. And actually, if you think, I mean, this is a three hertz building. Wind does not have much energy at three hertz. So what's happening actually is if you think about frequency response function, it goes over there, that's three hertz. Wind is in this region here where it's a quasi-static response of the structure, where dumping doesn't help. Uh, if you are talking about uh, random excitation, it's true, yeah? But mm. if we try, for example, to apply uh, harmonic excitation for the structure, yeah? In this case, dumping can help. But where is it, where is it, where is it coming from? Wind is not harmonic excitation, wind is random excitation. Yeah, but if you try to design it for an earthquake engineer, yeah, mm. in this case, you lose the stiffness of the building. In, fair, fair enough. In, in yeah. Yeah? If mm. you lose the stiffness of the building, it goes to uh, resonance frequency. In this case, you receive more, da more damage to the structure. Mm. So the only question and idea, if, if we can think about uh, increasing damp, it can, can help according to this ISO standard curve. Mm -hmm. uh, about service that uh, service uh, ab uh, ability and influence on people, uh, this uh, curve is related to the structure, yeah? Uh, did you think measure, measure or, or, or try to uh, incorporate the influence on, on people in, in the building? Because if we have this low frequency, yeah, in this case, people feel it and uh, did you have any uh, response from people that use it, use this building, if they feel? You mean post-occupancy survey? Yeah, we we haven't had any specific post-occupancy survey uh, on this on this topic. Uh, yeah. we, we talked to the neighbors when, when we were there. People said they when there is storm they hear creaking and cracking and things like that. But um, I think we will need some. Um, Behavioral psychologists or something to start researching a bit more in that field. I don't think, I don't think will be in Poland. We have a special code, special standard for for influence of vibration on people. So maybe we can cooperate on that. Uh, and uh, the question to to experiments uh, also: How did you fix to the structure the exciter, and how did you fix to the structure the accelerometer? I didn't. You didn't. No. It's friction. I mean, for 40 kilo, it, 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 the, the shakers were just placed on the on the floor, and then they were running, and then the, they were they were not sliding, because the, the friction is uh, the force was uh, smaller than the friction. And accelerometers and, for us. No, again, it's a it's a you know it's just a you know fraction of a g acceleration horizontally. You just basically put an accelerometer and and that's it. So maybe we will discuss it a little bit later. Mechanical engineers, they do connect a lot of things because they have over G, you know, large accelerations. But Owners don't, don't allow to, 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 to fix the sensors. And plus, plus that's, that's, that's an issue as well. But it, I, I, I guarantee it doesn't affect the quality of results. Okay. That's all. Thank you very much. Right, thank you. Uh, hi, is it working? Yeah, uh, my name is Slobodan, and I would like just to ask a couple of questions, even though some questions already the colleague asked. Uh, the first one is maybe related to the layout of the building, because here we, we are talking about the building with the flats and for the inhabitants. Mm -hmm. So uh, I'm wondering whether the, the layout and whole design process uh, tackled the challenges of adjusting the layout during the service life. For example, if you want to connect two flats or maybe to divide one flat into smaller ones, etc. So whether this building actually uh, can, uh, be, can be able to, to, to do that or is the construction quite rigid and, uh, and can't uh, afford that thing? Sorry, I didn't understand the, the, the key question. Is acoustics or did the layout between the flats? Uh, what was between the flats. Between the flats? Yeah. What is the so question between the, the flats? The question is whether it can be adjusted during the service life. For example... I just uh, like cutting a hole in the wall. Uh, probably, okay. yeah. Yes, actually, there was one one wall in the, the first three, the first three 
ground, uh, sorry, floors mm -hmm. in one of the flat, st flat stacks. They are uh, uh, floor, uh, flats designed for, for disabled uh, people, and there are the possibility one of the one of the walls has the possibility of future uh, adaptation and, and, and yeah. through without influencing the, the okay. we didn't have that into account yeah. so that's the one of the walls that we're, we're okay. taking into account yes uh probably the second question is also related to the design process like uh, I mean, this is over. Uh, this is let's say let's say experimental building, but I'm not sure about the earthquakes in the in the region where it is constructed. But as someone who, who comes from the region which is quite prone to the earthquakes, I'm wondering uh, what is the level of the earthquake this building could survive probably. I don't have a clue, uh, yeah. and uh, because I didn't design that before, and uh, and this is not experimental building. This was a, a building done to try to achieve efficiencies with CLT in affordable housing in, in Scotland. Okay. Then I happen to know all these uh, all these interesting people, uh, <laughs> and they convinced me to say, "Why don't you learn a bit more about your building?" And I say, "Yeah, why not?" Yes. Okay. We started testing all these things, but yeah, this is although the the, the contractor was very keen because they are a, an offsite manufacturing company, they are very keen on efficiencies and improving things. So they are very keen on engaging with university research. That's why they allow us to do some ambient vibration while we were in construction by Tom Reynolds. Uh, and, uh, but yeah, so they allow us to, to do a bit of, of research, but this is a pure commercial deal. Yeah, yeah. Well, I needed to ask that because that is the question we all we always ask ourselves, like, okay, maybe it is easy to do zones without earthquakes. In the earthquake zones, it is like maybe like a little bit different. I'm happy to, happy to serve the plans if you want to calculate the capacity. No, I don't know how to do that, okay. but I'm just wondering. Uh, okay, I had one last one, uh, but I can't find that. Okay, yeah, it, it is related maybe to the last question of the colleague. Uh, and that is uh, like whether you you plan, whether you're planning maybe to, to do the testing and maybe with some sensors, uh, maybe to talk, maybe to put them on the envelope, like on the outer side of the building and maybe track how the how the building is behaving uh, during the let's say after 10 or 20 years of usage because i think that after 20 years of usage the building kind of like adjusts itself to, to different things and to the uh, behavior of the of the inhabitants so maybe the the sense of result will be quite different after these years because i, I assume you, you tested it like quite recently after the execution the, the testing, yeah, it was done. The first slide was showing the the time frame. The testing has been it was tested. It was built in 2017. It was mm -hmm. the first vibration testing. Was 2020. 20 or 2020, right? 20, 20. And uh, the ambient vibration is being tested as we speak. Uh, the roof, that's uh, Vincent uh, setting up the the tests, and we haven't yet received all the results. So it's been tested. Hopefully, in 20 years' time, we'll all be here. We'll have funding, and we'll. <laughs> Go back and test again. Okay. That's 20, no, year, 20 years later and 2 million pounds later as well. <laughs> okay, thanks. It was a very nice <laughs> presentation. <laughs> yeah. Stefan Franke, Bern University of Applied Sciences in Switzerland. So, yes, also thank you from my side for all of all three of you. Very nice, very nice way to present. Also, this can be directly uh, taken for teaching. And one question to the uh, to the first speaker. You had this crushing top to crane. So you have the wall directly sitting on the top to crane elements in teaching and many people say this is not a way to do and you have done it without any top to crane reinforcement you said or do you ex don't you expect any problems with this or how did you account for we do have crushing we do have uh, swelling and, and uh, shrinkage how do you account for that so um, in two ways uh, making sure the the pressures were below the bearing pressures and just in the low place and the low plants and the wall thicknesses and the and the, and the slab thicknesses and the arrangement of the, of the stability walls and and then also predicting uh, or estimating reasonable long-term drying irreversible movement shrinkage from clt 
uh, as a service and uh, feeding back that to the architect and making sure that the facade and the finishes don't uh, don't uh, yeah well have have sufficient allowances for for accommodating those different improvements on the on the floor plates and in connection design uh, we avoided going through with a steel uh, wall to wall because as you say a uh, few years down the line it has squashed by one millimeter every floor plate well not every because the top ones will not do that uh, then you have potential slack on the on the on the connection so all the connections are timber to timber okay yeah thank you and question to vibration where uh, maybe I, I didn't get where have you put your loading your your uh, shakers on the top floor at the top yes uh, do you recommend always to do this at the end of the can deliver yes yeah yes okay. because so i mean that's that's picking. where motrip amplitudes are the biggest okay and and you also mentioned uh, during discussion that wind is yeah it's far below the three hertz or huh? the acceleration yes. to yes. wind what modes do we really need for the design? Is it only the first one or the first three? Or right. Do we have to go until okay. the six? Golden rule in dynamics, you need all modes which can be excited. So in essence, if you tell me what's the uh, energy content of the excitation, then I'll tell you how many modes you need to in include. One of the biggest problems which I've seen over the years is when people say, oh, you know, only first three modes need to be calculated for anything. It's wrong doesn't work like that dynamics it has you need to look at what's the frequency content of the excitation your earthquake wind whatever you know ground bone vibrations and then say well if there is energy it will get excited if there is no energy they're going to get excited we know typically that winds are really you know hovering around up to two hertz or you know that that you know it's not really three hertz is quite quite high which is why I have this theory that it is shaking rather than, now that I understand dynamics of the structure, it is shaking rather than vibration. And uh, that humans are actually not responding to vibration, but they are they're responding to really sort of a series of tremors inside the building, which are, you know, shaking bits and pieces in the building, which is a completely different, uh, you know, ball game. And by the way, we in Exeter now have a new facility, which is called V Simulator, which is a the biggest force plate platform in the world, four by four meters, which we can actually use to play signals, measure signals from Yoker and other buildings, if you have them, and actually try to see what's going to happen with people sitting on the platform, performing various tasks uh, and the rest of it, to see that, uh, you know, what's going on. Because currently ISO 10137 is based on a one-year probability, you know, one-year wind. What does it mean one year in for perception of vibration for humans? It means nothing. It's, it's again used as a convenience because we understand statistics of wind, but we don't understand statistics of human responses. So, what's the point mixing statistics of wind with statistics of human responses when there was never any kind of correlation? It's serviceability, it's what happens day in, day out. Yoker has, <clears throat> in the UK, we have two very strong seasons around the equinox, you know, in, in autumn and in spring. Uh, and we, you know, this building experienced 80, 90 kilometer, you know, uh, per hour winds. Um, and we, we have data and we will analyze it. It's still, it's still too early just to see you know, what's going on. Uh, but, you know, and those sort of windy days can last two, three days in, you know, in succession and the rest of it. It's completely different phenomenon than, you know, one year wind. One year wind tells us absolutely nothing. So I think we need to gather the information. What is the what is the acceleration? What is the impact on on that side? And then up to the fourth harmonic, maybe something like this. Because up yeah. Further, further, yeah. further up there is no acceleration anymore. Yeah, There's yeah. no no energy uh, introduced. Yeah. To the I mean, with, with the shaker, we were able to excite all the way up to ten hertz yeah, easily yeah, yeah. because we had energy in the shaker up yes. to ten yeah, hertz. Yeah, yeah, sure. You and uh, would you also think that with the ambient uh, vibration testing, you could get those, let's say, up to the fourth harmonic a harmonic one? No, no. Up to what you guess? Uh, difficult. I mean, it, it, again, depending which wind, which direction, yeah, yeah, what sure. gets excited, yeah. you know, it's, uh, you know, but it's, it's, it's a very, it, it's, it's almost like on a case by case basis. Um, it's a very, very tricky area. That's why 
you know, having a shaker, knowing what's the energy, what energy you're putting in, you know that if it's in, then you, if, if, if there is a mode, it will, it, it will come out. Uh, otherwise, you don't know what, what, if you don't measure excitation, you don't know all sorts of things which are very useful for dynamics. Okay, thank you very much. Hello to presenters, uh, because we are a little <laughs> behind the schedule. So we have uh, time for discussion during uh, our breaks. And now uh, one more applause for the presenters. Thank you. And we have a next speaker is uh, Simeon, uh, Simeon Anastasov. And uh, he will talk about uh, fire protection, protection strategy for Google headquarters in London. Hello, everybody, and uh, thanks once again for the opportunity to speak today. Uh, my name is Simeon Anastasov, and I work for OFR Consultants. A little bit about myself. My educational background is in structural engineering. But ever since graduating, I have been working as a fire engineering consultant. Uh, and uh, the company I work for uh, is OFR Consultants, which is an independent fire engineering consultancy in the UK. And we do a lot of work in the field of structural fire engineering and uh, mass timber engineering in particular. Uh, so, my talk today is going to be mostly focused on, on, yep, sorry. Can you hear me now? Perfect, thank you very much. All good now? Okay, okay. So, um, so what I'll be talking about today is, some general principles in the fire safety design of timber buildings. And I'm going to wrap these up uh, in an example, which is the Google European headquarters in London. So uh, I'll start br briefly talking a little bit about the technology, environmental impact, things that uh, most of us are probably quite familiar with, uh, as well as challenges with perception when it comes to mass timber design. Uh, and uh, I'm going to focus a lot on all the ha hazards related to mass timber and the fire safety strategy uh, with particular emphasis on structural fire resistance and how, uh, <clears throat> how standard structural fire protection methodologies apply to mass timber and how all the uncertainties are managed. And again, uh, I, will, I will summarize this by, by going through all the steps that we've taken on uh, the Google headquarters building. So starting off uh, a bit about mass timber elements. So uh, one of the most commonly used types is uh, cross laminated timber or CLT, which uh, uses uh, timber planks glued together uh, in, in different directions that allows us to take the, the, the typically uh, orthogonal properties of timber and use them in two-way spanning slabs. But we also have a lot of other types of engineered woods, such as uh, glue lamp beams um, and uh, timber joists, etc. Uh, the, the environmental impact. So we are all aware that there is a significant benefit to using to using timber in construction, and apart from the obvious benefit of phasing out other less energy efficient materials such as steel and concrete. Uh, there, there is the added benefit that promoting timber construction um, also results in the necessity to plant new trees and new forests. So as, as trees grow, they, uh, they absorb CO2, but as they mature, uh, this, uh, this process slows down and disappears. So the, the reforestation and the continued process uh, of planting new trees can, can be a significant benefit in the fight against global warming. 
However, with, with all, all of the benefits of mass timber design, and especially when it comes to fire safety engineering, there are significant downsides. And we don't need to be experts in fire dynamics to understand that introducing a combustible structural element to our structure uh, is gonna come with certain risks. Excuse me. And uh, be, because of that, there is a big stigma with, uh, with certain uh, stakeholders in the construction industry and institutions, such as, for example, uh, the, the, the insurance industry, uh, approvers, fire and rescue services. There is, there is an obvious and understandable concern with the design of those buildings. And what this has resulted in is that a lot of the proponents to mass timber design have taken it upon themselves to, to address these concerns and put out statements in the media, which, which are meant to, to downplay the seriousness of uh, a fire events involving mass timber buildings. And I've put some of the things that me and my colleagues have come up across, have come across in here. Uh, it includes statements such as COT is not only safe in fire, but safer than many other standard materials such as steel. And I'm not gonna read through all of them, but the, the, the common point here is that they are uh, very misleading and they're oversimplifying an extremely complex topic and a topic that the, the science, scientific community still doesn't fully understand. So this is where the, the, the job of the fire engineer comes in. So our goal is to manage the sustainability goals and the drivers of the construction industry with uh, the goals of achieving buildings that are safe in fire and what uh, the scientific community dictates about how we should be designing mass timber buildings. And unfortunately, oftentimes uh, our role is to be giving people the bad news and to, uh, to crush architects' dreams effectively. Uh, a very, uh, o OFR often gets, gets involved on projects uh, because of our significant experience with mass timber buildings. We get, we, we get involved in mass timber projects and as we begin to, uh, to convey all the implications of mass timber design to the client and to the design team, oftentimes in a few months, the project switches over to conventional construction. And that's uh, an unfortunate reality that we knew, need to deal with and, uh, and manage expectations. And hopefully in the future, uh, the, 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 the industry as a whole is gonna be more aware of the cost implications, the design restrictions that come with these. So we can see more of these building, buildings in the future. So uh, going on to, to the challenges uh, that, uh, that we face when, when designing a master timber building and the fire strategy related to that. So first of all is uh, the internal fire spread via the linings. So exposed timber elements such as COT do not achieve uh, the same surface per frame classification, which is expected uh, for most areas within a building. So we need to very carefully consider uh, the, the means of escape parameters. Uh, how quickly does it take everybody to leave the building or the compartment? And also consider how long it takes for the mass timber element to be ignited so we can uh, adequately advise whether any additional treatment can be necessary because in, in those exposed COT mass timber buildings, this could be uh, quite, ex quite an expensive part of the construction, pro uh, the construction process. So second here have structure and uh, the, the fact that mass timber elements contribute as a source of fuel. And this is a topic that I'll cover in more detail in the following slides. So I'll come back to that. Then we have compartmentation. So um, typical industry experience on how to maintain compartmentation and prevent fire from spreading throughout the building is almost exclusively, exclusively based on non-combustible structure. All the testing, all the products which are available on the market are intended, uh, are, are tested and intended for non-combustible substrates. <clears throat> then we have external fire spread. 
uh, because of the additional fire load introduced by the timber, especially in cases uh, where we have smaller compartments and what we call ventilation control fires, a significant amount of uh, burning can happen externally. And this can have two major effects. First of all, uh, you increase the risk of setting fire across your boundary to your neighboring buildings. And also, you uh, you enhance the risk of vertical fire spread throw, throughout your own building, which uh, further compromises uh, compartmentation goals. So back to structural fire protection, and I think uh, in order to better understand how mass timber fits within the picture of structural fire ratings, uh, it's it's important to 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 look into the background of structural fire resistance and structural fire resistance periods in particular. So in the United Kingdom, uh, the, the legal requirement for uh, design is set out by the building regulations. And the building regulations uh, give us what we refer to as functional objectives. So when it comes to structural fire resistance, the, the functional objective is worded as follows. The building shall be designed and constructed so that in the event of a fire, its stability will be maintained for a reasonable period. As you can see, this is very vague uh, and not prescriptive of, at all. Uh, this is intentional because it, uh, it leaves the responsibility to the designer to pick the best tool of defining how the, the structural fire resistance of the building is achieved. And the most commonly used tool, which is appropriate for simple and straightforward buildings, uh, comes in the form of guidance documents uh, or approved documents. Which, uh, which in terms of structural fire resistance, uh, look at the building and assign it with a fire resistance period based on its height and its use. And these range from 30 minutes to 120 minutes. Now, these fire resistance periods correspond to a performance in the standard furnace test. Uh, but the, 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 the question still remains about, is, is this methodology appropriate? to mass timber design. And intuitively, we understand that it's not a simple and straightforward building. And therefore, uh, we need to think about this further. So I think it's going to be useful here to look a little bit more into the, the background of those structural fire resistance periods, and particularly uh, the standard furnace test, or the, uh, the ISO fire curve, as we refer to it. So as society and the construction industry evolved, uh, there became uh, there became a need to uh, to design buildings which are resilient to the destructive effects of fire. So, at the beginning of the, the last century uh, in the United States, uh, a, a testing procedure was established. So, uh, with with the goal of becoming a standardized pr procedure that can be used on multiple buildings. So that test procedure basically involved a big furnace and a temperature time curve, which was effectively based on how fast somebody was able to shovel coal into the furnace to create the, the, the most onerous possible condition that uh, can be applied for building design. Now, from a fire dynamic standpoint, uh, the, the standard fire curve, which was achieved, uh, is, um, is, is very different from the behavior we can expect from realistic fires. Realistic fires uh, have a growth period, and then as they consume the fuel available to them, they, uh, they, uh, they decay and die out effectively. And uh, we, can see the, that, uh, we can see that this is not the case because the standard fire curve is infinitely growing. But despite this, it's still quite a useful tool because it gives us that method of standardization and allows us to, uh, to mass test and mass produce structural element with a fire resistance. And the way this, this curve, although unrealistic, is related to actual fire performance is through a concept called uh, time equivalence. So what time equivalence basically means is taking an arbitrary structure, structural element subjecting it to the full duration of exposure of a realistic fire curve and relating that to an equivalent time period in the furnace, which either, uh, uh, which either has absorbed the same energy by looking at the area under the curve 
or achieves the same maximum temperature. So uh, what this gives us is a tool to take any realistic fire scenario and correlate it to a furnace exposure in that simplified testing methodology. And later on, guidance documents evolved and took a more probabilistic approach on how to define fire resistance periods based on Monte Carlo simulations of realistic fire scenarios. But that's a very uh, wide topic that I don't really have time for today. So, but what, what, what I want the key takeaway to be from this is that a fire resistance period from the table doesn't mean that your building is going to stay up for that period, whether that's 30 or 60 minutes. It means that your building uh, has the ability to fully withstand the fire with uh, an equivalent severity to that period uh, and to withstand the full duration of that fire into some burnout. So fire resistance is intended to allow our buildings to survive burnout. But how does that, uh, how does that uh, relate to, to mass timber buildings? And uh, wh where do mass timber buildings fit within all of this? And I think the best way to understand how this methodology applies to uh, structural elements, elements which are combustible is to look at what happens in a typical fire test. So what happens is we put in a typical non-combustible element, for example, a steel beam. We load it up, we put it in the furnace, and then we get the heat burners going. And the gas supply to those heat burners is adjusted to match the standard fire curve that I talked about. And at certain point of time, when the element reaches some arbitrary deflection value, the test is stopped and the element is assigned with a fire resistance period at the time at which it, it failed. But what happens when we, uh, if we were to repeat the same process with a combustible element, the gas burners get going, the temperature rises following the standard fire curve, and then the combustible structural element be begins contributing to, uh, to the heat fluxes in that enclosure and to the temperature. And so what we would need to do is adjust the gas supply to match the standard fire curve for that test. And this is just not what happens in reality. As far as I know, uh, office buildings with feature, which feature exposed timber do not adjust the amount of furniture they put in, into them uh, to, to make up for the fact that the structure is combustible. So any, uh, any fire engineering calculation which attempts to evaluate the fire resistance period, uh, the fire resistance in general of a mass timber building needs to take that additional fire load into consideration. Uh, but there is an, a, an additional problem that needs to be solved, which is that with typical non-combustible structures, we have somewhat of a certainty in terms of burnout. We know that uh, once a fire consumes all the fuel available to it. Uh, if our structure is able to survive that period, uh, then we have adequately resisted collapse in the event of a fire. But uh, with a COT floor slab, for example, in theory, if the fire consumes all the, all the fuel available to it, we wouldn't be left with a slab to begin with. So uh, we need to uh, expand the concept of surviving burnout and also uh, include the question about auto extinction. Can we guarantee that to a reasonable standard, our COT structure is gonna auto extinguish itself? And one of the key, uh, key uh, elements of this is preventing delamination. So uh, as uh, timber becomes involved in fire, it forms, forms a protective char layer, which uh, which, which limits, uh, which protects the remainder of the structure and allows it to, at some point to extinguish. However, if the temperature at the glue line uh, becomes too significant, the char layer could fall off and a fresh amount of fuel can be introduced into the fire, leading to extending and prolonging the fire period, second flash over, et cetera. So that's, uh, so, any, any structural fire protection strategy looking at the mass timber buildings need to account for those two things, the additional fuel and uh, the lamination and self-extinction. 
And uh, in order to do that, uh, we need to look at uh, fire dynamics at, uh, at two different levels. First, the, the first one is at the material level uh, where pyro pyrolysis occurs. And uh, we need to uh, adequately define a mass loss rate that will give us a reasonable chance of uh, the, the structure going out by itself. And we also need to look at the compartment fire dynamics and the heat fluxes received by different uh, surf surfaces. And uh, the, there are different tools we have as engineers that allow us to do that. So the first one and probably most, straight, most straightforward one is encapsulation. We can simply encapsulate our timber structure, making sure that uh, the, the, the boarding or any other type of encapsulation is sufficient uh, to, to keep the temperatures of the timber element sufficiently low so it doesn't begin to paralyze. Uh, second method, obviously something to mention on encapsulation, obviously there is a certain, uh, outside of the environmental concerns, there, there is uh, a certain attractiveness to the exposed timber and it's not, it's not a solution that's often desired. So we need to look at other things. We can reduce the combustible surface area. And an imp important factor here is uh, prevent service, uh, surf exposed, combustible surfaces, which can radiate towards each other and create a feed feedback loop, which uh, uh, can keep the fire going uh, for a very long period of time and hybridize our structure. So, uh, so a common approach that we often use is when you look at critical elements of the structure, such as the core and uh, design those uh, with conventional means such as steel and concrete and uh, keep the exposed timber limited to, to COT slabs, for example. Another thing to look at, which is particularly important for uh, the prevention of delamination, is the adhesive choice. Uh, what we can do is use adhesives that are somewhat resistant to heat and uh, increase the temperature at which our bottom lamella would delaminate. Unfortunately, in the quantities which are needed for the construction industry, uh, these, uh, these are not readily available. So it, it, the, it's prohib prohibitive in terms of cost and in terms of timeframes for contractors. So another method that we can use here to prevent the lamination is control the thickness of the bottom lamella and uh, ensure we have sufficient thickness that uh, the, this bottom layer never falls off, or at least it doesn't fall off for the range of scenarios that we're considering as part of the structural fire strategy. And finally, as we've said, uh, demonstrating the fire resistance period of a timber building means demonstrating burnout and auto extinction, uh, but is that always the case? So in the UK, uh, the, the approach which has been taken from, from a guidance standpoint is that for buildings which have a uh, fairly low consequence of collapse or, uh, and for example, have, uh, have means, uh, means of escape parameters where people are able to evacuate very quickly, uh, can be treated uh, as any other buildings and can have, can have the standard guidance documents simply apply to them. Again, uh, the, the argument here is that the, the, the consequence of structural collapse is minimal and imposing um, all of these restrictions that I talked about, the design cost that comes along with it, the construction cost that comes along with it would discourage the use of timber at a smaller scale. So there is, uh, uh, the, there is the, uh, the allowance for simple buildings uh, to ignore that whole process. When, when we uh, go to more, uh, bigger and more complex buildings, anything uh, over four stories or anything that has sleeping risk associated with it, uh, this process needs to be followed very thoroughly. And uh, yeah, we need to demonstrate all these steps that I went through. And uh, how do we manage all of the uncertainty? Um, uh, the, the scientific process does not support our architectural views and our job 
as engineers is from a very early stage on the project uh, to, to, uh, to fully convey what is possible in a mass timber building. Uh, another important aspect is that the, the energy balance in a compartment which involves exposed external uh, exposed timber is not fully understood. The science needs time to catch up to the construction industry. And one of our main tools that we have when the science isn't fully understood is to just adopt conservatism. Uh, which means that in every other parameter of the building, in a, every other element of the fire safety strategy, we're being conservative. We, we are not uh, value engineering things that shouldn't be value engineered and making sure every other aspect of the building works when it comes to fire. Uh, but wh when it comes to what we can do in terms of the timber design itself, we can maximize the losses in the compartments uh in, in ensuring heat fluxes to the exposed combustible surfaces surfaces are minimized and we can also create large compartment openings uh, to ensure we get uh, a bigger proportion of fuel controlled fires as opposed to ventilation controlled fires and uh, ironically this is at odds with one of the goals i mentioned previously which is to prevent external fire spread and setting fire to our neighbors because of the larger openings so it, it it has to be a balancing act a solution needs to be found that works for both the structural side and the external fire spread size uh, we also can con control the surface area um, and as i mentioned previously make sure uh, exposed surfaces do not easily radiate towards one another and uh, introduce as much as, ma as many inert structural elements as possible to localize the failures. And again, uh, defense in depth in the fire prevention strategy, make sure every other element of the fire strategy is, is adequate and would not create any risks in the event of a, an unforeseen failure. And uh, finally, uh, validation through large scale testing is extremely important on a lot of our ongoing jobs we have uh, have a large amount of large-scale testing being carrying out at the moment looking at a combination of factors such as encapsulation partial encapsulation exposed cot elements just uh helping us understand the problem better and and keep up with the demands of the industry so uh when we talk about the overall fire strategy there are a number of things that we can look at uh, which uh, for any mass timber building become a must effectively. So first of all, we have automatic fire alarm, alarm detection, make sure that uh, any potential risk associated with the exposed timber elements have no bearing on the means of escape side of things because of prompt evacuation, uh, multiple stairs and evacuation lifts again, same logic suppression system, even though a large portion of the mass timber design uh, effectively ignores the, pre uh, the presence of suppression system or looks into the cases where this fails. It is an important prevention factor and uh, minimizes uh, the likelihood of structurally significant fires occurring. Uh, inert and periodic separation elements. Uh, this is particularly important for the external facade where we introduce pandro panels and other similar elements to prevent vertical fire spread. Um, and again, in our primary uh, frame elements, uh, what we make sure on our design is that the, the core is uh, constructed out of conventional construction elements. And there are a few main reasons for that. First, this is the largest concentration of services and penetrations. So uh, by, by keeping that localized in a concrete core, we ensure that the amount of testing and uh, products that we, we need to find for combustible substrates is minimized, which uh, makes the construction process a lot easier. And also this houses the firefighting core and uh, gives the fire and rescue service additional certainty uh, when, when tackling a fire in a mass timber building. 
And finally, uh, sizing of mass timber element for uh, surviving the full duration of a fire. These are all the topics I covered. So the thickness of the lamella, the adhesive choice, and the residual section that we're left with. And finally, uh, talking about uh, Google International Headquarters as, a, as an example of how a lot of these elements were incorporated in a building design. Uh, so we are talking about a fairly large building, which is uh, 290 meters in width be between 20 and 68, uh, sorry, 290 meters in length and between 20 and 68 in width. It has 11 stories with a total height of uh, 44 meters to basement levels. And what you can see in the picture is we have um, several concrete strong floors, which form our compartments. And in between them, we have the exposed COT slabs forming a mezzanine-like structure sitting in between uh, those concrete floors. The, the, the cores, again, are uh, fully constructed out of concrete. So the building houses office, retail, and assembly use. It's uh, right next to King's Cross in London, and it features these triple height compartments. Um, so key elements of the design. Critical elements are not combustible, uh, such as the cores and the compartment floors. Uh, it is possible to have um, critical, uh, critical structural elements constru uh, constructed out of combustible elements such as COT. However, that requires further consideration. Uh, we have large compartments with a lot of glazing, uh, minimizing uh, the heat fluxes received by compartment fires by the COT structure. We have thick, uh, thick uh, COT slabs, uh, which are uh, primarily driven by, uh, by the residual section, which is required post fire, a fire event. Um, we've developed a py pyrolysis model, uh, looking at the mass loss rates, which we are experiencing uh, to, to demonstrate the lamination. And very importantly, because of all the uncertainties, we have picked some fairly conservative flame extinction criteria, such as uh, a mass loss rate of three grams per meter squared per second, and an uh, incident heat flux of 20 kilowatts per meter squared. Um, the steel and concrete elements of the structure are designed for burnout with the fire resistance period that has been assigned to them, cognizant of the, of the additional fire load introduced by the timber elements. And uh, again, a residual COT section that is able uh, to, to carry the fire load case loading. Um, other elements of the fire strategy, the internal fire spread. Uh, again, I mentioned uh, the, the con concrete compartment floors, which split the building in three different compartments. Uh, we have the, the ground level separated in a similar manner as well. And in terms of external fire spread, uh, we have introduced uh, non-combustible spandrel panels, underhangs and overhang, overhangs to deal with uh, the, the potential for additional external flaming resulting from the exposed timber structure. Um, other features, automatic fire detection and alarm, vo voice alarm, ensuring that um, that means of escape is not an issue and not something that can be affected by a fire involving the structure. Sprinkler protection throughout uh, on smoke, on floor smoke clearance, which was primarily driven by property protection purposes. It was not something that was necessary, uh, necessarily there um, as a life safety measure. The evacuation mode is phased where if I go back, each of these three compartments evacuates one at a time. And that is why we place such big emphasis of preventing fire spread between these. And firefighting, uh, three firefighting shafts serving all levels, uh, evenly spread throughout the building with uh, ventilation provisions to the firefighting lobby. And a very important element here, which is something that should happen on all mass timber buildings is uh, we had 
we had the design through our Sages 3 and 4 peer reviewed by an external party. Uh, it's, uh, uh, as I mentioned, the, the engineering community, the scientific community still don't fully understand the behavior of uh, timber elements in fire. And it's very important to have a third party look at the design and, and make sure nothing is missed. And uh, the, the measures which are adopted are sufficiently conservative to account for the uncertainty. And uh, finally, mass timber introduces hazards uh, which are not captured in the scope of typical guidance. So it's very important to take uh, a different approach to look at uh, things holistically and uh, think about every single element of the fire strategy and, and how this is affected uh, by a mass timber structure. Sustainability is important, uh, but a building cannot be sustainable without providing adequate safety for its occupants or people in the surroundings of the building. Uh, and oftentimes it's important uh, to, uh, to, um, to control the architect's vision and make sure uh, that the building design is driven, driven by the safety concerns. Um, and of course, we need to manage expectation and uh, and make sure we 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 fully engage with with testing with the scientific community and and ensure that this is the driving driving factor for the design. And as as any fire safety related uh, topic, there is always going to be residual uncertainty. We cannot uh, design uh, or foresee any disaster or uh, the, the most critical fire scenarios which may occur in the, into our building. And this is where it's important to make conservative decisions with every single element of the fire strategy as a fallback if something was to go wrong. And I think that's pretty much it for me. So the floor is open for questions. Thank you. Thank you, Simon, for an interesting presentation. Um, yeah, there's lots, maybe those to talk about timber and fire, but when I see a hybrid building uh, of steel and, and timber construction, like, like this one, the Google headquarters, <clears throat> it feels to me like, uh, and maybe I don't, uh, don't profess to know uh, all the research that is, that is out there, but there is research going on in timber and mass timber construction and how does it burn and burn out and this and that and the other. However, uh, and yeah, reducing the amount of, of, of contribution from walls and things can help I understand that principle, but how did you solve the steel um, elements on this on this job in contact with the with the with the exposed CLT elements? Because to, to us, maybe in the UK, maybe it's not an issue in Europe, but uh, the steel industry feels like they are lacking behind. So what did you do to resolve the steel support? Because I see that in, in my mind, it's easier to support an encapsulated timber uh, wall, a uh, slab on an encapsulated timber wall than on a steel beam. So what did you do with the steel? Uh, so a, a few things. So uh, to some extent, it has been uh, captured in testing, uh, but uh, it, it's very difficult to capture all the possible uh, details that we have into, in, in our building. So one of the approaches we've taken is to add additional protection to these areas to ensure that charring of the timber does not extend into the zone where it's being supported on the steel element. So uh, if we provide local encapsulation, for example, we know that at least in the area where the slab is fitted on the steel element, the, 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 its overall thickness is going to remain the same and that's not going to cause any issues. Uh, but uh, problems like that occur all over the place. Services are very similar, where if you have a damper, for example, uh, it's, it's not designed to be fitted in something that might char away. So this is where concentrating those services into a concrete core is quite helpful. Uh, but yeah, it needs to be resolved on a case-by-case -case basis. In, in some cases, uh, the conclusion was that 
um, the fact that we have timber on top of steel isn't actually going to impact the performance in the fire, but in other cases, additional protection was necessary. So thank, thank you very much for the presentation. Very interesting, very comprehensive. Um, before uh, we saw that there was this uh, very tall um, timber buildings that was under design in London, you know, these 300 meter skyscrapers. After listening to your presentation, I would be a bit doubtful about uh, doing a building like this 300 meters height made only of timber. So I suppose that your strategy in that case for a skyscraper would include basically a hybrid building for what you said. So at least uh, like the, uh, to have a staircase, uh, which is non combustible basically. So that's perhaps is the only way we can think of uh, such a high timber buildings because uh, as, as you show in this building, this Google building is not a, I mean, it's a big building, but it's not a 300 meter high. Mm -hmm. And even in this case, you basically built uh, in the end a non combustible uh, um, skeleton, I would say, with inside a bit of uh, secondary uh, timber member. So any comment about this? Because we heard, we heard more and more, even in this construction, but not only in this construction, we heard more and more that we would like to build skyscraper out of timber. Mm -hmm. And to me, probably fire safety in this case is the major issue, I would say, even more than vibration and other stuff. So any comment on that? So uh, the case I presented here is, um, is fairly specific uh, to, to this building. Um, I'm not trying to say that uh, that any other sort of structural form involving timber is not feasible, but there are some very critical elements uh, that that if we were designing the building, we would be trying to implement. Uh, the, the concrete core uh, straight from the start resolves a number of issues and makes the project a lot more feasible and it prevents the issue I was talking about where combustible surfaces radiate towards each other and create a feedback loop, which prevents the auto extinction. So if, if a, a building like the one you're describing is to be designed and the auto extinction problem is adequately resolved through, uh, through light, large scale testing, through proper analysis, then it could be possible. But uh, based on uh, my, my experience, Placing a limit on the amount of exposed timber is very important. And uh, when we're talking about extremely tall buildings, it, it will become even more important. Thank you. Pedro. Pedro Palma from Airbus, Switzerland. Very nice presentation. Thank you. Um, you mentioned the uh, fire scenarios, and we all know that if you move the furniture around, you get a completely different. Yeah, is this okay now? So, we talked about realistic fire scenarios, and we know that if we move the furniture a bit around, you get a completely different fire. Uh, how did you select your fire scenarios, especially because you show these big open spaces and, and yeah. everything? Thank you. So the way the fire, so I didn't go into too much detail about this because uh, our time is limited, uh, but uh, the, the fire scenario, scenarios were selected through a Monte Carlo simulation where we effectively took the building geometry and the available ventilation. And we took probability distributions for things like fire load, uh, fire spread rate, etc. cetera. So we, we threw them into a Monte Carlo simulation and uh, we created a probability density curve of fire severities by translating these simulated design fire into fire resistance periods through time equivalents. And the, the, the fire resistance target was selected by benchmarking uh, to the guidance expectations uh, for a building of this height uh, based on these but it was it had taken into account the specific building geometry now this fire rating was only applied to non-combustible elements of structure because uh, of the challenges of doing uh, of doing that with combustible elements and um, for the for the cot elements 
the, the design fire is corresponding to the fractal that we're interested in that defines our probability target for the building were taken out and plugged into simulations uh, uh, to, to FDS simulations and uh, calculations of charring rate for the COT element specifically to define the depth of the slab that we needed and the residual section that we could realistically get. So from the University of Edinburgh, and I wanted to ask, um, you mentioned that you, for the, some of the exposed CLT sections, you're um, assuming you know, there is going to be sufficient depth after charring that, and you're obviously trying to prevent lamination. So do you assume it's sufficient depth so that there is still sufficient lamella there left, um, so as in we don't lose the entire one? And even with that, do we still have like, how does the balance in CLT work? Because with normally slabs are symmetrical, the same with walls. And specifically for compression elements, the, the uh, difference in the uh, heat gradient in the compression elements, the, can, is it possible to model? Because eccentricities and, and the buckling and everything starts to be a massive issue then. Yeah. Um, is, do we just prevent from any compression elements to be CLT in those situations? How do you deal with that? Uh, so, so starting on the, the first part of the question, uh, there, there are a few important parameters. So first we have the temperature of the glue layer and making sure uh, this is sufficiently low to prevent the lamination. And we also take into account the zero strength layer and, uh, and the sufficient loss of strength that we get into the COT section. And as, as you mentioned, uh, be, because, because they are symmetrical, we are, um, we are effectively losing the lamella, which provides us with the, the, the tension zone in the orientation that we're interested in. So uh, th this ha has to be captured as well, because the lamella that we might be left with at the bottom would not have the same longitudinal properties. Luckily, the, the fire load cases are significantly lower than uh, uh, the, the driving cases for the design, but all, all of these things need to be taken into account. And in terms of compression elements, uh, to be fair, I'm not completely sure. Um, a, a lot of the work we've been doing uh, today uh, has revolved around COT slabs in particular. We've more recently started uh, to look into uh, glue lab elements, both uh, columns and beams. And what we found on those is that because of the exposure on multiple sides, the residual section that we end up when we take into account the zero strength layer is extremely small. So we're still looking at ways where in which this can be resolved. But what you mentioned is definitely something that needs to be looked into. Ian from DBI in Denmark. Uh, thanks for a very nice presentation. Um, like you said, the ventilation conditions are so important for particularly the decay phase and uh, ensuring self-extinguishment. Um, how did you estimate or account for the breakage of glazing and yeah, creation of ventilation openings? Um, so a very good question. So. The, the main way in which we've accounted for uh, the, the glazing breakage at the moment is, sorry, this is not moving. Can we move a few slides? I think it's next one. Yep. So the, 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 the main way in which we've accounted uh, for ventilation breaking at, at this point is as a variable parameter of uh, the Monte Carlo simulations. So we have taken um, uh, conservative estimates where between, uh, for example, 30 and 100% of the glazing breakage occurs for any given structurally significant fire. And every time a new fire scenario is simulated and, uh, and, and plotted in the community density function, that number is simulated at random. And uh, the, the conserv because this element of the design is so crude at this point, uh, we have skewed it towards the conservative uh, end of the spectrum. 
by, by, by limiting that range to some extent. Hello, I'm Chamit from ETS Zurich, and uh, thank you for the presentation. It's really nice. Uh, I have also a question regarding the time equivalent. So, the, but you presented it, uh, when it is the CLT. So, the results, it's like that the maximum temperature, like it can go it, rather than not its change, rather than it has a higher time on like the similar temperature. It's like the finding on that. Uh, that's my one question of that. I mean, another part of that is like, if the CLT uh, has if the Charlie fall off, or we can say uh, yes, like it's continue burning without a burnout for some time, can we add that for the time equivalence right now? Um, so I, I don't fully understand the first question, but on the on the second question, uh, our approach to the lamination at the moment is to try and completely prevent it in uh in the in the cases in the confidence limit that we're interested in because because of the unpredictability and how much it complicates the fire models uh we, we have very little confidence in being able to adequately capture what what will happen in the event of a delamination and that's why uh we we specify a bottom lamella depth that would would ensure this will not happen in uh, in the confidence limit specifically that we are designing to. Of course, more severe fire events can obviously result in that, but, but that's a much, much bigger uh, discussion. And I, I'm not sure, I, I didn't fully understand the first question, if you can repeat. The graph for the addition with the CLT when the time equivalent, if you go to the next slide, uh, um, yeah, so here it's a maximum temperature is not changing, right? It's just like the, the graph is dragging forward rather than the change of the temperature. Yeah, so the, this is just a, a diagrammatic representation. So the two ways in which we can compute the equivalent time of fire exposure is by looking at the area under the curve, but uh, in 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 structural fire engineering, what's more commonly used is uh, the, meek, uh, the peak temperature attained in the first case. And we correlate that, uh, we, we look at the time, to, uh, the time period in furnace where that peak temperature occurs. That's uh, the most commonly used method. That is. Very much. As, as you said, uh, CLT is uh, composite. From, from wood and, and from adhesive. Of course, if we have adhesive, if we take into consideration the temperature plus transition of, of, of adhesives, we should protect uh, these adhesives. And, and you also said that we should think about uh, increasing the thickness of the outside lamina, not bottom, but, but outside according to centricity under low. And the question is uh, if you can recommend the proper, like, thickness of the outside lamella. And if we are thinking about composite material, we also can think about uh, apply application of different kinds of wood. And what kind of outer wood can we use to have the CLT panels more uh, safe according to fire? Uh, to be fair, I have not really looked in, uh, in the material aspect of it. So I'm not really aware of of what improvement we want, might be able to get from different wood products. But uh, given the, the, the industry demands for these buildings, we are basically working with what uh, the mill factories in Europe are able to produce. Uh, but it's, it's definitely worth thinking about that in the future. And in terms of adhesive and the bottom lamella, uh, typical value that we found to work for most mid to high rise office buildings is around 40 mil and yes as you mentioned this goes sim uh, um, symmetrically on both sides but something important i forgot to mention earlier on is that as part of all of these measures we recommend uh, that a certain thickness of screed is provided on top of the slab to prevent it from becoming involved in the fire from both sides where we could potentially be losing uh, 
uh, thickness and be left with a very uh, small residual section. Okay, uh, thank you, Simon, once again. And uh, <laughs> now we have a really, really short break of 15 minutes. So be back at 11.40.
actually our job and we have designed hundreds of timber building in Italy. And we have designed a lot of multi-story timber building. I think, think more than 10, five, six, seven around Italy in the seismic region. So I think we are quite good confident with the, the theme that here we are going to, to present. And the nine story, it's the highest one, but we have done since similar to seven, eight in other region. So uh, that building doesn't work. Okay. For that building, we are trying to, I try to resume what I would like to say. I start to describe the basement of the structure. I think that's a key point because I think when you are talking about seismic uh, project, it's, I think it's important to, to speak about the entire building. So the CLT building is important, but also important the concrete the concrete foundation or the concrete basement, because you have to transmit the resultant force to the ground. And I think that a good way to, to design that type of building, if that's a designer, design all the structure, since to the roof, to the foundation. When you start, we have done, we have tried to done <coughs> that we, we design just timber uh, structure. And we have tried to design just timber and then other engineer design the basement or the first floor. But I think that's not the best way. I think that the best way is that an engineer has the responsibility and design all the, the structure. Because uh, if you are talking about vertical load, maybe you can do it. You can do the, you can calculate the force that the shelty building gives to the ground and then you can calculate the ground. But if you are talking about seismic engineer, there are a lot of uh, particular stuff that you have to take in account that I think if one engineer designed all the structure, that result could be, could be better. And that's why I would like to speak a little bit about basement. Then the, the, in the construction site, there were two buildings, one of five story and one of nine story. Then again, I would like to speak also about the five story. Then we will see why, but I think that for us, was maybe difficult to, to design five story. Then I would like to, to, to explain you why. And then we, we are deep inside the nine story and we will speak about other stuff, uh, particular like general aspect, numerical modeling, durability, acoustic, fire behavior. I'm structural engineer. So I, I would like to, to speak about uh, the structural point of view of that aspect. So, Rovereto is in the north part of Italy. Uh, to tell you the truth, that's one of the uh, lowest uh, seismic area of the Italy. So that was a, a great point to design the building there. But we, of course, we have rule that it's general. It's not, it doesn't depend of, on the area where you are. The, the seismic rule are general and you have to apply to all the building. Of course, then you have the, the horizontal acceleration that is lower since the force is lower, and then you can design, uh, of course, uh, more easier the connection and so on. That's the two building, nine story, five story, and then we have a common uh, basement. So the five story is composed of 45 apartment with an area of 510 square meter in plan. The nine story, it's 29 meter in eight and 570 meters square meter in plan. So <clears throat> that's the, the two building. Since the beginning, we can see and we can see that the building it's quite I can say well placed. It's they have a quiet ratio between eight and between the length, and so that's. Uh, that's it's a reason where the design was quite fluent. And then we will see why it's happened. So some description, that's the two building and share a common basement of 3,500 square meter with 80 parking. So we have uh, decided to, to uh, put every, I can say, small uh, room above the two 
the, the, the footprint of the two building. Why? Because there we can use a lot of sheer concrete walls and then we can substantiate quite good the two building. Then the parking was placed around to avoid since the beginning to have wall that doesn't go through the foundation to the to the to the roof of that deal of that building. That was one great great uh, I can say idea to, to avoid problem with the structure. So the basement structure it's quite I can say easy basement vertical structure of 30 thick concrete walls and pillar with different geometry and then we have a solid concrete slab or 30 centimeter thick it seems not to be a great uh, i can say a structural effort uh, it's quite normal it's nothing uh, special so the foundation structure are a slab of 40 centimeter in that area in the other area, we have an inverted T beam of section equal to 60 per one meter point six. So the entire basement were designed for fire resistant air 90. And that was the description of the basement, it was a quite common concrete basement, nothing special. And then the description of the building. I would like to describe the building and then speak about the choice that we've done and why then the building seems to be quite not easy, but quite not so uh, with the structural so important. So the elevation of the structural of five stories was shelty wall with thickness of 141, 124 millimeter, the thicker at the ground floor. And then they tapered in eight since 100 millimeter. It was five layer panel or three layer panel. It changed a little bit uh, depending, and then we will see that depending on the fire request, we change from five layer to three layer. Three layer, it's more economical than five layer to, to, to do it because we have to glue two time uh, less. And so, uh, of course, the, the factory tried to use 153 layer. Then elevator and stairwell are made of CLT panel continuous in eight with a thickness of 120. Then we have inside that uh, structure, we have column 20 by 40 at the ground floor or 20 by 20, and then they taper in eight. Here uh, with five story floor, we have optimized the floor depending on the on the span, we have 100 millimeter, 102 since 220. In that building, we have also some uh, steel beams that helps, of course, to to the floor to to have the span where where they need. More or less, you can see that we have the the external wall that are the external part of the apartment. Inside the apartment, we have placed column to to have more free of the spacing inside that uh, that uh, that area, or you see here, or in that apartment here. Nine story, nine story. I think it's a dream. Every structural engineer, it's a box. It's a perfect box. Thirty-two per twenty for twenty-eight meter. So that's one reason why then. The, the design was not so complicated because we have started with that conceptual design that the timber building with that floor that was the I guess in Italy so we have started with uh, uh, an easy I can say uh, a shape of the building we have shear walls of 11 meter in length that means that you have really uh, braced uh, system, really important brace system. And then we have tried to, to do it regularly to, to, to arrive with a plan to have regularity in elevation. That means if you are talking about seismic action, regularity is the key 
factor of a, a good seismic uh, design or project. We have started the ground with 158 millimeter thick wall, tapered since to the top 100 millimeter. We have also designed a special, I can say, a special layer distribution in order to get uh, the fire resistant, then we will see. So we have also a wall that have two layer in the same direction, the same vertical direction, because if you are talking about charring rate, then if you have two layer vertical, then you can save the external layer of the wall because the choice then we will see later in detail, but the choice was to design the, the structure R60 uh, without any protection. Then we have put the protection to avoid the, uh, to, to put in combustibility material in the stairwell, in the, uh, in the area where the, the fire design needs, but then the, the calculation was done with naked straight structure, so just wood. At the base, there are columns, 24 uh, plus 48, that taper in eight. Here, <coughs> uh, the, the, the idea was to, to have slab of constant thickness, 140, more or less, at each story. And in that beam, in that uh, timber building, uh, no uh, steel element were placed, of course, except the connection. So it's just made totally in timber. Here, I, I would like to, to focus on that aspect that I think was the key aspect of uh, uh, that good, uh, I can say, design of that building. So that the, the client, the, the, they, they decided to do social housing. They focused also on the cost. They, have understand that nine story is the highest uh, structural uh, timber building in Italy. So they, they have decided to put structural engineering at the top and give to him the power to decide it. And that was a completely different approach usually in the, in the structural project. I think that who would be done structural project normally, everything cares about isolation, thermal performance, everything uh, looks like the, the color of the house and stuff like that. Of course, structure engineer is the last part you have to do and stop. So structural have to, to, to work well without create problem to the other aspect. When you design, that was the reason why when we designed five story, that people doesn't feel that important of the structure. They just do what they want at the end. Uh, they say, okay, now it's time to, to do structural. We do, but, but you have to, to follow the other problem. If you have uh, holes, you have to, to arrange a beam. If you have a special apartment, you have to put beam, you have to, to move uh, slabs and so on. Here, every uh, choice, was uh, subjected to the structural engineer, and I, I in that okay in that project, I can decide if it's okay or if they have to to move, because the structural point of view uh, start to be the most important of that of the, that construction. So, so what, what I tried to 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 do in that project, structural wall <laughs> with significant length and planimetric distribution as symmetrical as possible with respect to the, to the two main axes. Avoid having walls that interrupted into the basement. That, of course, wasn't impossible, but a lot of the, the most of the wall uh, doesn't interrupt into the basement. So we have a continuous wall that pass through timber to the concrete to the basement. Regularity of the span of the floor. That's the reason why we can have slab that it's the same thickness. That uh, con could also uh, uh, better to, to have a, a diaphragm, uh, a diaphragm, uh, I can say, uh, behavior of the floor. If you have the same thickness, you can do 
uh, more easier uh, connection between every diaphragm. And then permanent load lighter as possible. If you are talking about seismic, we are talking about acceleration and mass. If you low, if you have a mass low, you have less force, and then you can have, uh, I can say, a, a smaller connection. A smaller connection connection means uh, a cost effective of the construction. So permanent load. Then we will see some point permanent load. The permanent overload was equal 1.5 kilonewton per square, per square meter. It means that it's quite low and every, th every people who works there, acoustic people, isolation engineer, they have to think about the material that they would like to use. They have to perform analysis to understand if the acoustic is okay. And so th they have done th that effort and there was a really important part of the of that design that every uh, designer involved in that project have done the best to try to, to find solution that fit in the structural efficiency of that building. So the total permanent was one was 1.9 kilonewton per square meter. If we add the weight of the CLT slab, we achieve 2.6. For comparison, permanent weight of the basement is equal to 10.5. In that project, four timber floor with finishing correspond to weight to one concrete slab. So that means more or less the nine-story timber building correspond in terms of permanent load. Of course, accidental load is the same, but in terms of permanent load to two three-story building made in concrete. That, that was really, really important. If, if you are talking about seismic, then the permanent load is the load that act on the structure for real. Then you have just a, a percentage of accidental load, 30% if you are talking about residential or other percent. But that means that in that way, you are reducing a lot the, the weight. So I can say that the, the key aspect of the nine story building was that psychological point of view that everyone uh, think that the structure is important and then so they have tried we have tried all together to to optimize the structure working on the other parameter on the other aspect starting to the cell weight starting to the the, the i can say the scheme of the apartment that uh, they try to follow the the sheer the sheer walls and so on so <clears throat> thanks to that point of view we have a large but reasonable basic connection, basement concrete slab with reduced thickness. We designed, for example, a lot of, uh, I can say, a hotel. They, they, we do the, the rooms that every room is equal to another on each floor. Then you, you arrive at, at the ground and there you have the hall of the, of the hotel. And there the, every shear walls interrupt on the concrete Usually we do concrete elevation, concrete slab, but that, that concrete slab, it's not 30 centimeter, it's 50, 60, it's pre-stressed, it's something other that you need to, to I can say, to, to support the, the load that it's not, that have no path that go to the foundation, but that interrupts there on the concrete deck. So that was a really important stuff. Okay, numerical modeling and element sizing. We have done two, really more than two, but two main numerical model. We have the, we have used a one program to 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 design the basement, another program to design the timber structure. Here, when when you design a basement with a program that is a finite element method that use finite element method, it's really important. We have seen that's really important to, to avoid that timber structure hangs the concrete deck to the top. So you have to take care about the shear walls that not goes through the foundation. You have to maybe schematize, schematize with pin element or something like that, that avoid 
to, to hang the element of the concrete to the, if you do a, a mesh with a shell, with continuous shell, it's happened that that shell hang the concrete deck to the upper part on the building and then the force go through something in the floor and go in another place. So that's one important stuff. Another important things that we do usually, of course, we are doing a simplification. We are taking a building that is up to one story and we uh, took away the story and we do without it. Then why we can do it in seismic area? We, we control that the stiffness of the basement that usually is done in concrete that it's really stiffer than the, the CLT elevation. It's so stiff that it doesn't influence the moving, the, the eigenvalue of the building upstairs up to the to the height. So in that case, we have done a model with the basement and a model without the basement. And we have seen that the period change more or less to 4%. It means that that ground, behave, that uh, uh, basement behave like a ground because it's so stiff related to the to the timber that you can, uh, I can say, uh, uncouple the problem. You can, uh, why we do that? Because we have a software that analyzes in detail the timber structure. We have a software that analyzes in detail the concrete. And so we have decided to specify two models. And then it was quite good to compare the result of the two models and see if everything is OK. What we, we have found, we have found that the, the first Hagen value, the period was one second, one second point two, more or less. It depends on the program that you are using in the first direction and the other direction. That's, I think it's good result. We, what we, we put inside the model, inside that model, that the software develop a model that we have developed at the University of Trento, in the Timber Research Group of Trento, that schematized the wall with, um, with a spring. Inside the spring, there are the shear, uh, the formability of the wall, there are the, the formability of the connection. And so inside it, in that model, there are the formability of all the connection. But you have to keep attention to what the number you put inside the model. We, we use more or less a rule that the, the period of that building could be more or less assumed equal to 1.56 seconds each level. So if you have nine level, 0 0.9, more or less. Two level, 0 0.2. That's we assume to, to, to fall to, it's a part of our design. I know if I put here, inside here, the spring, the, the value of the spring that uh, it's theoretically that you can theoretically calculate in the connection, you have probably a period of 2.5 seconds. But that not was good because if you are talking about seismic, uh, if you have the response spectrum, if you move uh, far far away in the period, then you have the, the I can say the force that lower and lower and lower. If you follow that rule, you you can model as as best as you can, but but then you have to 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 control to check the result if more or less is about around here. I mean here I think nine stories zero point nine. We are in the range of that value. So uh, we we have done also a simulation with different value of stiffness, and at the end we decided to to design it with that value here. One, one, one point related to, to wind that before we have talked about it. In that area, low seismic area, wind force were found to be similar or even greater than six minutes force. We have two uh, main uh, direction where the, uh, the area of that facade is very high and where the, the area is lower. In that direction where the, the area is high, we have nine, 900 
1,000 kilonewton for the seismic, 1,000 and 100 for the wind. So the wind, the wind force is higher than seismic force. So we have designed for both, of course. But it's not so strange that with that building that it's so high, you have period that move from the uh, elastic from the uh, plateau of the seismic spe spectrum to the right part, then the wind start to become also important. We have just uh, uh, designed with wind as a static force, but we were quite confident that with that shape of building, with that number of shear walls, then wind doesn't create vibration in the building. Of course, if you have, as you were talking about before, if you have different shape or different stuff, then wind start to become important. And of course, if you move that building in seismic area with higher acceleration, then wind could be lower than the seismic. It depends on the height of the building and on the place where you put, of course, in Italy or in another seismic area. Some number, if you are talking about column, we have 1,000 kilonewton more or less as actual force. It's not so a big number. If you think about, if you are used to design concrete structure, 100 kilonewton is not so big. If you design a school with two story, you have 100 kilonewton in the pillar, more or less, for example. If you are talking about shear wall, we have axial force of 400 kilonewton per meter, 200, 200, 600, and shear vary between 200 per each wall. And then the problem in the timber building, we know it's the traction right and side of the shear wall. Here in our project, the maximum value is more or less 500 kilonewton, but there are also walls that have zero traction. The wall at the center, that really long, that have a big amount of vertical load, have zero traction. Okay, another problem that we have, uh, uh, I can say, try to solve is the compression perpendicular to the grain. As before, someone has said, if when we have wall, floor, and wall, it means that the wall, the, the floor works with perpendicular to the grain direction, and it's become to to squeeze, and it's become to 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 have compression that maybe it's too large, and it's become to the floor. So with our, uh, I can say with our uh, design, uh, in our uh, developing our problem, we had more or less decided that the problem start to be significant with the number of floors that it's it five or six. We have seen if you design multi-story CLT building with five story, compression perpendicular to the grain, it's not so significant. Of course, I'm talking about floor with normal span, four, five, six meter. If you have a floor that have 20 meter in span, of course, then the compression perpendicular to the grain at three stories is important. But if you are talking about residential floor, we have seen that five or six level, it's, uh, it's okay for compression perpendicular to the grain. More, it becomes to be a problem. So we have decided to mix technology, balloon frame and platform frame. We have done walls that goes through more than one uh, floor. And then we have <coughs> for the, the two, for the first four floors. So we have a wall here that goes through four story without interruption of the floor. And then we have start to build with uh, uh, platform frame technology. Not all the, the wall was used like that, but just the wall that have the vertical load more important. There are some walls that have few few load here that we have decided to design <coughs> with that, uh, uh, I can say, plat normal platform frame. OK, uh, here, pero here we, we introduce some important things that that walls have a, a certain length, and it doesn't deform, because parallel to the grain, 
timber more or less at few deformation. In some other area, we have some deformation. So, have, so we have to, to start to think about the different movement of the building. And then we will see when we talk about acoustic, when we introduce that uh, acoustic profile that deform a lot, what we have decided to do. So <clears throat> in what we have done for the beam, the beam have the same problem. If you put the beam that, that uh, it's uh, placed on the wall and then you put up the wall, the wall start to, 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 to deform the beam. So when the beam arrive parallel to the wall, we have hanged it with this special steel plate so that the, the beam is not inserted inside the wall, but it's just arrived at the head of the wall and then it's hanged. And when the beam goes inside the wall, perpendicular to the wall, we have created this special tooth that avoid that the wall up goes directly to the to the beam, but it lay to the wall on the floor above. What about the column? For the column, that of course is the uh, most important part because there we, we concentrate a load and, and we bring the load to the foundation. We have decided to, to work with a column that goes just for one story. Then we have designed that cutted place, that notch where the uh, beam have been placed. And then the column of the uh, story up, just put it like that. And then here we have a compression parallel to the drain. That part is just to, to put here the, the beam. We also, that, that first part is not structurally important, but <laughs> we use that to, to prevent the instability of the column at the center. So in that area, we can also cut away like this, but we have leave uh, in, in that. And then we have uh, created a hole inside the floor where each column has been placed and uh, have been fixed with fully treated screw. So in that way, we have we were able to transfer directly the compression parallel to the grain to the ground, hanging also that beam in that notches. That why that was quite fast to build and. I think it was quite a good solution. We have then done more other places. And other things we have seen, when you are using that metal stripe, that could be also thinner, 1.5 millimeter, two millimeter. That was not so thin, that was eight millimeter because it's nine story. But when you use it in one story, two story, if you, screw that on the upper wall to the to the wall uh, on the above wall to the upper wall then here you have a slab concrete when you put the finishing on that of course that part a little bit deforms and that stri metal stripe start to work in compression and here you have a buckling of that metal stripe that's more important when you have more load and more <coughs> uh, and more height of the of the building. So we have decided. We were quite discussing with the, the carpentry that do it, but we were decided to screw just the above part. It doesn't screw the upper part. We have screw all the upper part when all the finishing, not not all the finish, but uh, more or less the eighty percent of the of the finishing was put on the floor. To leave the, the each uh, floor to leave it deform freely, and then we have screwed the, the steel plate here to avoid that the steel plate takes the compression. That was done also because then we will see briefly we, we have put it inside acoustic profile. That acoustic profile gives more than normal deformation. What we have about what we have done about durability. For me, it was the, the most important things to do. We have decided to start timber walls 20 centimeter above the floor finishing. It means that the floor finishing are here. So we have think we have tried to think a little bit 
what we can do and we have we have decided to, to put in place that uh prayer it was that was a, a curb in the, a prefabricated curb in concrete so that was the deck of the uh, basement that was a cast inside uh, concrete curb 60 centimeter eight up to that and of course the, the the finishing here is inside here up to that we have designed that special prefabricated concrete curb that we have applied on the concrete inside curb inside the manufacturer they have leave holes for the treated bar we have put that concrete curb on the uh, on the deck and then we have fixed with concrete bag and deck proxy resin here and here that's the the same uh, base of the uh, clt panel and we have decided to give at that curve just the vertical load and shear load the traction we have designed special connection for the traction that we will see so concrete concrete have more or less the same uh, strength of the timber 15 megapascal so vertical load no problem 2000 per each meter of vertical load can take it here we have transferred to the connection to that bar that goes to the phone to the concrete deck we have high level of prefabrication and of course the the precision in the execution because the, the our problem was to to cast inside that concrete curb with the precision of timber structure. We try, we try, we fight every day with manufacturers that do it because they do error. Concrete works with one centimeter of precision, timber with one millimeter. And when you start to put each other, then you start to have problem. And so with that prefabrication, you can move it and you can fix it where you want. So the timber manufacturer goes on the, on the construction side, fix it, and then start to, to put up the, the connection. What we have done about uh, traction force. Traction force, we have decided to divide it in two parts. The first, it, we call the lower intensity connection. Then we have used uh, uh, the normal connector that you can uh, also put after the concrete is cast. And then we, the high intensity uh, steel plate, we have a uh, precast inside the, the concrete. We have done stuff like that. We have fixed it. We have uh, put it inside the, the, the concrete uh, curb here. And then we have put the concrete. That solve a great problem because if you start to, to calculate the bar that it's uh, cast that it put it inside the concrete after the pulling of the concrete then you can achieve high level of tension so i think that if you are talking about multi-story in seismic area that have to be a solution that we have to to replace it because if you would like to have high intensity of the force then you have to do something like that that's not so far from what they do in the steel construction that's quite normal at the end it seemed you have that steel bar here. Then we have designed a special metal plate. That's the U plate with here is concrete curb. You put the concrete curb inside that place. Here you can move a little bit if you have something to move. And then, and that was that was the, the special one that we have. That was the precast uh, plate with the bars. And then we have put that U plate here. That was the, the regular one to use with concrete curve. So something about the acoustic. If you are talking about acoustic profile, the acoustic engineer start to talk with me about put between wall and floor, something that deforms a lot, doesn't like too much to me. <laughs> so we had start to think about what exists in the market. There are stripes that deform a lot and there are stripes that deform less 
So we have extract from the model the load, and the, we have decided, depending on the vertical load, what type of acoustic profile have to be placed. Of course, more than resist, more it costs. This was the reason why we have uh, differ the, the things. So we have created a map where each wall have the color on the stripe that the people have to put there. And that introduce another problem. If we start to think about wall that goes around more than one floor and wall that have floor that's the four, acoustic provided the four, then you start to have different information. So we have done a, a cutting file. So the, 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 the wall, every wall have a different, not every, but we have divided in three group, have different eight to take in account if you have wall that goes through for two story that have to cut it a little bit less than the other because it doesn't uh, it doesn't deform in the other deform. Otherwise, you have in the, the floor that is horizontal. So we have done it because if you are talking about nine story and you, you lose one millimeter each story, at the end, you, you lose one centimeter that start to become a little bit important. And so that, that was done on the, that file that, uh, file that uh, the carpet used to, to cut the, the wall. And at the end, it works, I think, good. So what about the vibration? We have performed the usual vibration, the usual check vibration on the floor. And then we have decided to divide the floor depending on the apartment. So we have a central part that is the stair, that's one floor. And then one floor that it's stopped here, that's one apartment, another apartment, another, another. That's the, the idea was not to transfer the vibration through the to the floor to the to the other apartment. That's quite, I think, common solution to avoid the transmission of the vibration. What about fire uh, engineering? Uh, the request was to have R60 structure. In Italy, we have a prescription that if your building is higher than, I think, 25 meter, then you have to have R5. So we have designed it. We have started to think about how to do it. Put passive protection, don't put it, then they have to be certified. Then the, the I can say the plumber having to, to do hole inside it and so on. So at the end, we have decided to, to design Air Santa without any protection. Of course, then we have put the protection when where in the zone where it's necessary to have uncombustible materials, stairs and uh, uh, elevator. What we have done in the in certain point, we have put board, glue and screw to the wall to protect at, for instance, the, the support of the beam to protect uh, some other area where the load was higher. And then we have designed a special stratigraphy that's five layer, but with two layer in vertical direction, the two external layer in vertical direction in order to get uh, a stratigraphy of the wall that uh, can resist again uh, I can say that the load after 60 minutes of the burning. And that's what was the work on the fire. Uh, then, of course, we have, we, we don't have the fire engineer have uh, designed the compartment, the compartment and uh, all the other stuff. From the structural point of view, that was the, the decision that we have taken. Okay, some data, 800 CLT panels, 60 walls panels each story, 1,050 100 cubic meter of engineering wood that more or less equal to, to fill one story of that building with wall. More than 1,100 screw, we have used fully treated screw, a normal timber screw, and then 10,000 kilo of plate that 
means custom steel plate to, to take the connection, to take the force for the connection. Realization, 320 month man per day, more or less on the, on the construction side works between three to six uh, uh, men. Of course, also the stair was done in CLT because the choice was to done everything in CLT or timber. We have used also glue lamp. One thing that I think was really, really important, it was decided that I think it was a normal decide, decision, but not, not ever is done to protect every floor with a, a, a protective barrier. They put the floor, they put the barrier, and then they start to put the, the wall. Of course, if you are faster, you can avoid it. You can put the floor, put the wall, and then put the floor. If the, the construction is quite small, maybe in two days you can do it. If you are lucky, it doesn't rain. And, but if you are talking about that square meter, I think to do a, uh, a decision like that, it's mandatory. Otherwise, you can leave the floor with three days in the rain, and then you have problem of durability then you can have later in the in the time. So that's my presentation. And I think that the time could be okay. Okay. We can do if you have a question. Okay, so uh, <clears throat> so the question is uh, on the floor vibration side of things. Mm -hmm. uh, you said it's a uh, you try to do things in a standard way. Yeah. What what is the standard way for CLT floors? It's a CLT floor, is it? Yes, is it? Yeah. In Europe, okay, uh -huh. it's okay. In Europe, code five, there are. Uh, recommendation for vibration you have to check the frequency if you are higher than six i think then you are okay you robot say <laughs> if you are lower then you have to deep in detail you have to check the deformation of the floor under one kilo newtons of force that it's less than 0 0.1 millimeter don't take the number as real but more or less <laughs> Uh, you are okay, then you have to do a check in velocity on the floor. And if it is not uh, uh, okay, you have to check the acceleration. And in, if you are less than that parameter, then you are okay. Otherwise, Eurocode say that you have to deeper uh, investigate the behavior. In that case, we are quite in a normal situation, four meter span. Uh, floor with 140, so everything was really okay. Of course, when you start to have longer span, then uh, it becomes to be a little bit more. With CLT, then you have a great advantage that you have a collaboration of the entire panel to to the to your vibration responding. So it behaves really better than when you have a joist uh, floor. Okay, so now if you have panels, I mean, are, are the panels connected between each other? Yeah. Uh, so what to do? So, okay. Uh, when you, this panel becomes really important to connect each other, especially in seismic area, of course, you have to, to create a diaphragm that distributes the force on each floor. So when I've done the, the vibration check, I have in consideration any connection between the panel. Like a piano keyboard. In the check of vibration. Of course, then we have calculated that connection. There are, so they improve the behavior of the slab. And we have calculated for the seismic force. We have used fully threaded skew at 45 degrees, each 20 millimeter, 20 centimeter more or less, that connect uh, each floor, each other. So my last question is then the, the separation between the different plots. You know, is that actually affecting the in-plane stiffness of the, of the uh, or 
level. Yeah, of so course. I mean, you're trying to do yeah. you know, No, no, of, of course it, it uh, affects, but we have just uh, done uh, with a cutting of the floor. Then we have reconstructed the continuity in the plane with the screw. So it's not the timber, it's just the timber that's cut. It. It's like to, to have different play, different pieces of timber that put in there. And then we have uh, screwed it again and screw it to the wall down to create that behavior in the plane and the stiffness. So we have just cut the timber part. And then of course with the screw something passed through, but it's not as ever uh, entire piece of timber that connect the, the floor. Presentation as an engineer, as an engineer, it's a pleasure to, to see such solution. Uh, comment. Uh, of course, the building also was not so regular in time because it was trapezoidal. In such a case, we can assure that the center of weight is in the same place of center of stiffness, yeah. so it can be designed, of course. And the question is related to steel double screws according to seismicity. Yeah? You presented the place at the bottom where the, the timber structure is connected to the concrete, yeah, and mainly is uh, connected with screws. So what is your opinion according to seismic excitation? Because typically if you have large cyclic uh, excitation, especially in seismic area, it is repeated, yeah, uh, about durability of that. Because okay. in uh, maybe few years or, or, or dozen of, of, of years, we, we can have a problem with, with that. What's your opinion about this? Okay. So, uh, <clears throat> of course, we, we have designed the, the building in seismic area using all the rules that have to be used in seismic zone. So you have to, uh, to allow the connection to do plastic hinges, uh, in two way you have uh, and so on. So if we are talking about screw, a few, some years ago, we have done some research at the university. Have yet, we have seen that screw under cycling load have had problem. Then I think that have been introduced a new standard where they have to uh, test the screw also under cycling load. I don't know if now they have to do it or if it's something that it's in progress. But they have to, uh, I think, ensure that under cycling load, the steel of the screw, it, it had to resist it. The problem was that when they do screw, they overstrength the steel in order to be able to the screwdriver to inside the screw. And that process uh, gives at the screw some behavior that was not so good when you do it in secret way. So I think that there were an improvement of this uh, uh, in our, uh, I can say, experience. Now, the skill that now we use doesn't uh, uh, have problem with cyclic uh, behavior. And so uh, I think, but I think that you have to be sure that uh, the skill that you use have no problem. The skill are with product, product in very different, uh, uh, company and so I don't know if then every company do the test and uh, ensure that the cycle behavior the connector have to be uh, I can say uh, okay. What I can say also is that when you are talking about uh, seismic that uh, frequently occur, the structure stay in the last range. So if you have more than one earthquake with low intensity, it doesn't. Uh, happen nothing when you have the, the, the important earthquake there you can also have damage and then you can repair in some way or okay rebuild the, the building so i think that uh, the, the i can say cycle behavior of uh, every type of connector is really really important in seismic area and you, you have to be sure that of course that behavior works
not related to the uh, stickness of or, or, or durability okay. of connector, but uh, I was thinking about the validation of timber, yeah, because this yeah. is the weakest yeah. part. So but, if we have cyclic test, yeah. still go well, start to overlies it and uh, yeah. it goes stickness and, and constraint. Yeah, yeah, that, that, that's true. But when you end, when you have embedment that it's validation, then you are out of elastic range. And there you are saying that you have the a big earthquake that could damage your structure. So when you, in that way you have damage your structure. Of course, if you have a validation, you have damage. And then it's that connection is out of service, and you have to to absolutely change it to, to replace it. Or I know, I know. In fact, I think that timber structure have a great advantage not nine story but two story three story one story we can start to design with q factor equal to one that means that no validation at all if you can have the the, the big earthquake the earthquake that uh, have the probability of 90 100 and so on so you can design structure in seismic area that preserve it's uh, I can say it's durability in the time also with the, the, the great earthquake but you have to spend money at the beginning more money at the beginning because connection are higher if you do it with nine story I think that you maybe in Roberto you can do it if you do it uh, in high elevation high seismic area then you aren't able to take the force so you have to to, to, to decide that, that you have damage and you have to replace it but with a uh, small timber building you can do in different way you can still use the seismic rules because it's good because uh, gives you more uh, durability not durability but more uh, i can say uh, more. You, you can have more resistant as you you are designing but that you can prevent that you have plastic deformation with the great earthquake but that's seismic engineer so we have decided that you can have damage on the building so okay uh tiziana thank you for your interesting presentation uh i have just a couple of minor questions if uh, you can answer so the first one is uh just to have an idea the Roberto area was the big ground acceleration to be considered Zero, and, zero, seven. Okay, so it's quite low. Okay. And uh, uh, the force reduction factor that you have uh, taken into account for this system, that's, let's say, a combination of balloon, balloon type and the platform type. Okay, we have used 2.5, 2.5. but column was just pinned, column. Okay. We have just used shear wall as a... Yeah, but let's say considering that you have very long shear walls and yeah. so on, were you confident to use 2.5 and not two or less, let's say? We were confident because uh, I think that uh, uh, with, we have uh, applied the capacity design rule. So we are quite sure that if something happened, uh, that connection starts to work, that we have a lot of uh, shear connection that uh, works and the two connection at the end at the beginning. So 2.5, according to my experience, could be a good value to, to design structure like that. Uh, of course, you can use less than that value, but I think that with 2.5, you can have a good result. That, that uh, and the last one, I was just wondering, considering it's, let's say, somewhat low seismicity area and pretty tall building, uh, did you maybe have any problems with the deformation due to, to wind or force loads? Uh, and if you have considered or maybe calculated what are the top accelerations uh, due to seismic forces, because uh, previous studies have shown that this might be very, let's say, problematic, especially yeah. at high seismicity areas. So, thanks. Okay. I think that uh, if you are talking about the limit of that building, if you are talking about low seismic area, I think that we can increase a little bit more. I think that 10, 12, we can arrive there. Of course, we can also do 20, but then the economical point of view start to go away from what we have to. I think that one, two, three more 
uh, level could be. And then uh, I think that if you are moving in the more seismic area, of course, then you have more problems. But the problem is that the bacon base connection, I think that there we have to do work to understand really how to transfer that great traction to the concrete foundation. If we work there and we maybe discover something new to, to have more forces, then we can also do the same things there. Uh, for the acceleration, uh, we haven't done uh, the, the uh, any, I can say, evaluation of the acceleration there. We have seen at the literature and with that shape and with that uh, type of shear wall that we have, we have think that could be not, could even be a problem in that picture. So we have solved with, without any particular analysis. I think we need to stop with the discussion because Istok has just five minutes uh, for his presentation. So uh, Daniel and the rest, you can ask uh, Tijana a little bit later. So now we heard something about the tallest timber building in Italy, and now we will hear something about the largest timber building in Slovenia, at least they say so. So, Isto, you have five minutes. L allegedly, allegedly. Okay. Okay, thanks everyone. Um, this thing is on because it's really funny when you stand here, you don't, it doesn't seem like it is. Okay. Um, so see, this lecture was meant to be a buffer for uh, our timekeeping from the day one <laughs> we made the agenda and it's also gonna be this case now. So I'll just very, very briefly go through the building and then you still have some time to maybe visit the laboratory. So you have the maps in your bags and people are waiting for you. You can maybe visit two to three and we postpone lunch for 15 minutes. So it's gonna start at quarter past. It would also start the plenary part at quarter past two as well. So we have maybe for 45 minutes of discussion. Okay, so welcome in the building you're actually in now. So a bit about, about us, so we're a private nonprofit research institute. We were kind of like a European spin off from these things here, University of Primorska, Fraunhofer WKI, National Building Institute and the Cultural Heritage Protection Institute. So we were placed here and right here at the seaside. So what we do is uh, we work with renewable materials, mostly timber, but also side streams. So natural fibers, flax, hemp, whatever. Our structure is 70 employees, half women, half men, almost half international employees. So the official language here is English, um, which does influence also my Slovene from time to time. And we work in this TRL spectrum, mostly trying to transfer technology from let's say, the academia towards the industry. And we are really, really proud of this interdisciplinary structure, but because we don't have time, I can't really tell you more about that. So let's just move on. We're gonna to skip to this video because we don't have time for it. So why is this the biggest timber building in Slovenia? Not so much in sheer height or whatever, but it's because of the volume of timber that's in it. So it's 870 cubic meters of timber in just a load bearing structure and about a thousand overall because we also have claddings, windows, doors, everything made from timber. Uh, the building was completely designed by the Institute itself. So the architecture, static design, HVAC, it was all the people who work in this building today, also the monitoring, the restorative design, the laboratory and so on. So it was pretty much done by us. Um, we have 10 different labs. So characterization, microscopy, pa, 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 and so on. So you have them on your floor plans and you can visit a few of these. So if we are right here, so this building you see outside is actually this big one over here. So the labs are around this main part and one is actually inside. So when you're gonna walk around, feel free to explore. Also feel free to go upstairs, but on the other hand, you know, you can miss lunch then. Oh yeah, you can bring food upstairs, just please don't bring any food to the lab. Some labs are a little touchy when it comes to uh, chemicals and coffee spilling and so on. So the building also has like an LCA made from cradle to gate really shortly course kind of like expected the foundation because it's made of concrete had the biggest influence and the structure the structures have con well it's concrete wood and also steel of course the more we move down let's say doors and windows first of all because their volume is small but second of all because they're all made from wood have the lowest influence 
Um, of course, because the building did give off quite some CO2 during its both its production and design and everything, uh, we have also set, let's say, countermeasures. So how to fight the CO2 we're emitting, well, by team building and by planting 3,000 oak trees on the hill right above us. So um, the oak trees are above this big, so I know we're all planting big ones. But in the next 200 years, they are going to offset more than two and a half thousand tons of carbon dioxide. So the reason why I choose oak, which is slow growing and not spruce, well, oak is here actually a local species. Most of Venice is actually built on wooden oak piles. So uh, spruce was never native around these areas. Okay, so this is how it all started. Regardless of being of timber construction, you still have to do the excavations. It's a karst terrain, so you have a mix of basically bedrock and soft clay. That's why we have foundation clay, 16 centimeters thick. There is a parking garage in the ground floor. Then we have this basically plate above the garage and above the first floor is still concrete. Steel frame in the middle. Why steel was chosen? Because I came into the design phase a little later than the architect did and we had the floor plan set out. So if I was to change these to timber, they would have grown in size. And then the exit, fire exit corridors would have narrowed down and that wasn't an option. So we kept them in steel and they're a little smaller in size. We have the concrete lift shaft and staircase. This was a lengthy discussion, either to have it in timber as well or not. The final decision was made to have it in concrete. Again, looking back, I would have rather seen it made in wood, but it was a very long uh, back and forth of the debate. Okay. So, and then timber started coming up. So, you know, to get until here, it was about six months, let's say, from excavations. And to get to the top of the wooden part was about one month. So the staircases came in in one piece, dropped down. So they're made from glue lamp. The rest is made from CLT. So all the outer walls you see are visible CLT, the highest visible grade. All the CLT ceilings you see here are the lowest possible grade, but they only have spruce. They don't have any pine because pine is a little reddish. So it really stands out. This is all pine. And you can actually get it for the same price. So at that time, the price difference between the walls and the, the floors, well, ceilings, was 18 euros per square meter. Today is probably double that. So if you imagine the amount of square meters in this building, you say it quite a bit. And because they're tall, it's really hard to see the defects if you're like really exactly looking at them. So there's also a way how you can save a little bit of cash. So that's how it all started coming together. Renders versus reality versus renders versus reality. So you can really walk around, check it for yourself. Um, the building is also heavily monitored. We have like over 130 measuring spots. We measure everything from the from temperature, humidity in wood, humidity in air. Um, there are permanent thermal cameras on the facade. Accelerometers on top of the building, air quality measurements and so on. Um, we also have, let's say, really explicit monitoring of facades to actually be able to predict how a certain type of timber uh, modified or non-modified, if modified with a certain procedure on which side of the building, which climate conditions, how it's going to look like in 10 or 20 years. Because what often happens is, you know, an architect want to have a wooden facade, looks great on, in the first year, and then, you know, in a couple of years starts to become all patchy and everything ends up in tears. So um, this is something that would be really good if you give architects a tool that they can actually show their clients, you know, your wooden facade is going to look shit in 20 years, um, unless you use maybe this kind of a modification. So anyway, so we're also looking at how, let's say, this microclimate is affecting the whole situation, because this is basically mimicking these old Istrian towns. You have narrow streets, high buildings that really actually make a lot nicer climate in the summer. It's not that hot. On the other hand, it's not that windy and cold in the winter time. Um, okay, just a bit of the modeling, concrete part, steel part, wooden part. Um, the garage has its own floor spacing, so we were basically using concrete walls in the ground floor as wall beams. So these are basically spanning below the cross. This is the timber part. You can see we also have a big truss above us. Part of it is steel, part of it is steel deep to make this different span we have here. because. Rest of the building is actually eight meter span, single spanning. The governing criteria was no, no other than vibration again. So the plates are actually 28 centimeters thick here. So they're very thick. We have floating screen and the vibrations are just, you know, kind of, you can 
can feel them if you walk by someone. So again, this vibration issue, as Alex very often points out, should in the future be solved by not adding more mass or more material. So one of the things to look out for. Okay, so we're also we were doing a bunch of in situ testing of the building, uh, force based vibrations, uh, ambient vibrations, to figure out the modes to correlate them to the models to figure out the damping and so on. This was all done within the same project we were missing in the morning. Okay, so I'm going to leave this open. This picture is going to change every, I think, 15 seconds or so for all the people who are there on Zoom and YouTube. Um, and don't have the benefit to walk around the building now. So all of you are now invited for a little tour. So again, dinner, well not dinner, sorry, lunch is going to start in 15 minutes. So that leaves you with a chance to visit about two labs before you can come grab some food. And I'll see you again in about an hour or so. And sorry, no time for questions now, so you can ask me later.
Je ne de là. Ah, ok, c'est de là. Ok, everyone, welcome back to the plenary session. So, before we move on, just a short hello, also from the director of Inrenew. So, Andrea Kutner. Yeah, thank Please. you, Istok. Uh, so, it's my Great pleasure to welcome you, Edino Rinu. And uh, I do not know many faces, but uh, I hope that through the next four years of the cost action, Helen, that you will come here and uh, many times and that uh, we will have the chance to also establish uh, strong collaborations. And um, it's nice to see the house lively. I would say also that uh, since you're all the experts, you should look through the eyes of potential use of the building as a research object, which Shino Renew is doing. And I'm sure that many of you have at home projects that some data from this building could be enhancing your research. And um, I uh, would be happy if we can be part of it. Otherwise, just uh, maybe two three words about Dino Renew. We were established five years ago. Today we employ 70 people, about half of them are international employees. And uh, the main thing uh, in terms of research is the use of renewable materials in the healthy living uh, built environment. And we uh, are aiming to do interdisciplinary science, which I'm sure you all know it's not that easy to do. We do have uh, several cases of very successful projects where interdisciplinary is really the, the key to deliver new knowledge uh, to the next generation as uh, well to the society. 
uh, the laboratories are brand new, quite some equipment is coming in the next uh, two, three months until the end of August. And so I'm not sure if you had the chance already to go through and see it, but um, there is short term scientific missions that the cost action is having. So you're always welcome to come and uh, use the equipment at other premises. Um, with that, we we'll just uh, wish you a very successful meeting, uh, not only in this lecture room, but also outdoors in front of the building, as well as at the conference dinner, so that the bonds are created and that uh, innovative new ideas are born here in uh, Slovenian coast in Isola. So thank you. Okay, thanks, Andrea. Okay, now we move on to the plenary part. It's actually ra a rather short agenda for today. So it's, okay, this stopped working again, sorry. So I may actually have to stand here, but um, never mind. It's, it's only a few slides. Okay, so only two points of the agenda, and this is basically the main well, goals or um, I can also say kind of deliverables that were foreseen for this year. One is the state of the art report. The other is the heat map survey. Now, if you remember how cost was act, how this action was actually put together was to have an interdisciplinary action that different people from different profiles can have um, their opinion on the topics we think we may actually have covered, but it's a question if we do. So, you know, silly case, uh, also Tiziano was showing you this. So let's say you have the demand to connect the building together properly, nicely to, you know, to have the transfer of the seismic forces, the wind forces. On the other hand, you have the acoustician come in and say, oh, oh you have to decouple this because you have transfer of sound. And very often you can come to contradictory details. Now, you know, you are all experts, you know how that works. Um, the thing is, that more and more people who don't know how timber buildings function are gonna be doing it. And if they only look at the codes, even the new version of the codes, which are gonna be you know, much bigger in volume, if I just put it this way, this is still not gonna be solved. Europe was very clear on that we have to build more wood. Um, even Ms. President said it loud and clear in September 21, um, sorry, 20, that in the scope of the new European Bauhaus. house, we have to build more in wood in order to transform the construction sector from the uh, CO2 emission sector to a CO2 heat sink, sorry, heat sink. Um, and that inherently leads us to the fact that we're gonna have more and more timber construction and more and more unexperienced people doing it. Not just in the design phase, also in the execution phase. So what I was planning also to show you, but I didn't have time was, let's say all the issues we were facing with our building. It's comparatively small to the first one we've seen in the lecture. So it's only three stories, but the amount of trouble we went through because we had a main contractor who was used to working in concrete. And then they moved to timber, which is a much more sensitive material. Just, you know, explaining to them that they actually have to remove the water after every rain and they have to cover it and so on was completely, in, you know, incomprehensible to them. And we're going to be running into more and more of these issues as we go along. So, that's why this action was put together, that we have different profiles from the investors to the engineers, acousticians, uh, you know, municipalities and so on, that they can actually have their say and we can have some sort of a greater, wider overview of timber construction. And that's going to then bring me to the second part, so the heat map survey. But before we go there, I want to actually talk a bit about the state of the art report. So the state of the art was never so clearly defined on how we're gonna do it. We had different discussions at MC1. So to have a special issue on timber engineering and so on. But the discussion we had yesterday at the steering group was then made as such. So the state of the art would actually be made as a book of abstracts. So these would be two to three page abstracts plus references for one topic group within the work groups. So that means around eight abstracts per working group, which means around 80 abstracts per action. So a draft of these would be made one month before we have our next meeting in Gothenburg in October. 
And this would be circulated within the work groups. So the revised abstracts would then be circulated one week before Gothenburg throughout all the action. And then it would be presented at the action. Each work group would get two hours to present their outcomes. So this would be brainstorming within the work groups. And then we would all contribute our comments because work groups, of course, are still in a way, you know, dedicated to wind and vibrations, to seismic and to fire and so on. But then, of course, you also want to have people from a completely different field comment on another field. And that would happen in Gothenburg. And those comments would then be taken in as additional chapters to that book of abstracts. So actually have the opinion of different fields on what the current field thinks is the thing. And after that, we would actually then, uh, after three weeks after that, we would have this new interdisciplinary comment version. And then one month after that, we would have the final star report. So this is now changed a little. We are, this still has to be voted on by the MC, but still the idea is to have a classical state of the art, which looks at what's going on, what, what the current situation is, let's say things where the issues are, but then also have it supplemented by this interdisciplinary perspective and comments. Now, this is something that would actually move. This would actually move from year one to the beginning of year two. So the first of December would be this final delivery date. So you will be asked by your group leaders to provide input, to provide comments. Um, some groups are super active, well, most groups are super active. Um, and uh, you're gonna have these discussions today in the afternoon after we finish with this part. Um, but then the other part, is the heat map survey. Now, if you remember how this looked like um, in the MOU, if you were reading it, it's basically like a matrix with different colors. It's pretty much uh, fields on the vertical and different engineering fields on the horizontal. And you can have potentially different interactions. So you have, let's say, wind loading, seismic loading, acoustic design, rigidity, durability, and so on, and how these different design fields can potentially interact. Some have no interaction, some has, have a positive interaction. So let's say if you increase the mass on top of a timber building, it's actually going to be beneficial for your wind serviceability design, but it's actually not going to be beneficial. It's going to be everything else but beneficial for your seismic design because you're going to be increasing the mass, increasing the forces. And this is what the heat map was all about. Now, how to get that thing together in the widest possible perspective? So one thing is having a discussion within the cost group and work groups and so on. The other is moving beyond. We wanna have the really widest possible range of opinions. Also of people who are not in the action because we cannot have so many, regardless we have more than 220 already, but we want to have a survey that's as easy to use, but on the other hand, as fruitful with results and outcomes as possible. So this was, these were the instructions to our programmer on how to do it. So basically, when you are gonna enter the portal or let's say the survey interface, you're gonna put in some basic data. So your name, surname, affiliation, country, and then also other things like years of experience with timber structures, your background, your main current activities, if you are a member of a work pack, sorry, of a work group or not. So this is to give us some background on what the people who are giving, going, to be, going to be giving answers, uh, where do they come from? And here are some lists of you know, what you're going to be able to pick from. And then in the next phase comes this matrix thing, which so far doesn't look like a matrix because it's only made here to collect data. So if you remember, I said, you know, one expert area, how does it then compare to another expert area? So you're going to choose the first area from this list. It's a kind of a comprehensive list, but it's still, it may have something missing. So it's also gonna have the option other. So let's say in my case, I would, for example, choose, I don't know, seismic response, first field, acoustic design, second field. Then you have design phases of a building. Design phase, building phase, um, exploitation phase, and recycling phase. And then you write in, okay, I think that the seismic versus acoustic in the design phase can be a problem because we can come with, you know, contradictory details. And I'm going to write this in the, this tech box. 
and I'm going to assign the grade to it. You know, how bad I think this interaction is. Is it like a one? Well, it could be a problem where it's like a five. It's going to cause, it's going to wreak havoc. So this was the overall idea. And we have the first working draft here. So I don't know, I hope this is going to open. And I hope this screen sharing thing I can actually now change to to the, the people who are online. So I'm just gonna, okay. Oh, heat maps are right, here it is. Okay. So, close it down, because I can't see anything. Now, it looks like this right now. Oh no, you can't see anything, okay. So, let me see. It's probably because of the, the thing. Slow this down. And no, not yet. Close all windows. Close all PDFs. So bear with me. Okay, not still. Just a second. Can someone fetch the IT, please? <laughs> Tim, if you were so kind, just to more eager. Yeah, that's the thing. I just don't want to mess anything so I wouldn't accidentally break Zoom uh, because then I would lose. Oh, okay, we're like this. Okay, I'm gonna have to be a little careful with the typing because now I have to type on screen, but okay, anyway. So you see, it's very simple and sleek because the idea is we, it can be done both on a desktop, but also on a mobile because, you know, you're watching Netflix, it becomes boring and hey, why not do the survey? So, okay, so I'm already logged in. So I'm just gonna use my email address here. Uh, yeah. Damn that American keyboard, huh? Nope. Yeah. Where's the ad now? <laughs> Shit. Uh, should be somewhere here. <sighs> Is it number two? Who switch? Okay, sorry. I'm just gonna switch back to the Slovenian keyboard. So, huh? Okay. No, it's only no Slovenian. Okay, good. Okay. Yeah, back in business. Thank you. Okay, password. Let's see, hopefully I, I type wrong. Okay, don't say. Now this is still a draft version, so there is no capture, no, no, no checking of who you are and so on. But the idea is you can actually come back. So you're gonna be logged in. If you wanna change your answer later, fine. But you're not gonna be able to you know, give five different answers from you know being an anonymous person. So of course, here's my profile, my you know, there's experience, my background is and I save it here and that's it. Now, going to the survey here. So choose expert area. Let's say, okay, like I was telling you before, say seismic response first area. Expert area two. So I was telling you before about, let's say, acoustics. Okay, choose acoustics. And I have different building phases. So I can say, okay, design phase, which I've already done. <laughs> Is this stage a problem? You have a tick mark here. If it's not ticked, it's not gonna come in. We're still gonna fix this. So is this a stage of problem? Yes. And I write here what I think the collision is. The detailing used for say the connection, connect, connect, connections, uh, connects the buildings tightly together. However, the acousticians want to decouple the building's elements and reduce 
the transfer of vibrations across the building. This can lead to conflicting, contradictory details. And I gave it a collision mark of four. Okay. So then I could also say, well, oh, construction phase, could this be a problem? Uh, you know, maybe exploitation phase, could this be a problem? Could be, let's say, if, you know, people don't have a acoustic transfer or they have it and, you know, the building is safe, safe against earthquakes, but, or, you know, whatever. So you see where I'm going with this. So different phases, different collision issues, and different grades that would be assigned to that potential problem. Then I click save. And that's pretty much it at this development stage. So of course, then you could go out through all these metrics, fill it up. You're going to have a system that's going to monitor what you filled, what you can still fill, and so on. And this is it for the first stage. So there's not going to be data processing in this interface at, as we speak. This is going to be done later because you can imagine there's going to be quite a lot of data here. So because then we can make correlations to, let's say, what the architects think the, where the issues are, where the engineers think they are, where the, I don't know, the municipality mayors think they are because, I don't know, they had some bad experience with timber construction and so on. Um, we can track throughout time you know, how much a certain issue has increased or how much people think it's increased through the years or think something is not a problem anymore and so on and so on. So the post-processing is going to be done in a third-party software like R or MATLAB or something like that. And that's where we're going to get our heat maps. So I think I don't really have that one on the, um, on the slides anymore. Uh, but if you look at the MOU, you should be able to see how it looks like. Just let me see if I put in the slide, just as a reminder. Uh, no, I have. Okay, but then so let me get this thing back to, to the screen. Okay, so this is a draft version. So again, um, don't worry, it's gonna be a little bit more functional when we get there. So why am I showing you now this at this stage? Because at this stage, we can still make alterations and changes. And when we have everything finished, it's going to be a lot harder to change anything. So based on what you've already seen, it's kind of simple, but the background, the back end is already quite complex because there's quite a big database being built and we have to take care of course of the data protection because there is your personal data here of course has to be locked and protected so maybe Benjamin could just have to tell you a bit more about that so we're not keeping your um, passwords on our server and so on so this is this is well taken care of but just this interface and this idea of actually looking for trouble because this action is actually about looking for problems. We're not so much looking for solutions, at least not in the first year, or maybe first year and a half, but we're looking for where the collisions can come from. If you have any ideas, suggestions, critics are very welcome, of course, as long as they're constructive, um, on how to improve this, we would be very, very happy to hear from you. So the mic is open and feel free to speak up with any suggestions, you can still come up, come to come to us with the with the emails later on. Not a problem. But yeah, Alex. Right. Okay. So, uh, <clears throat> do we have a social scientist who was actually consulted about the questions? No. I would strongly recommend we get one because. I just examined last year, last week, uh, a PhD thesis dealing precisely with this kind of stuff, done by a civil engineer. Uh, <clears throat> and, uh, you know, there was a social scientist who made actually quite a lot of very, very useful. Uh, yep. they, they do this kind of stuff for a living. I mean, we would like to check H0 hypotheses and then, you know, see, you know, all sorts of uh, things which may be happening, but they are not happening, or they're not happening with a certain percentage of you know, sort of a probability and things like that. So yep. I would suggest that a social science looks at that. Yeah, well noted, questions. I agree. We actually have one, but she's on maternity leave. So that, that was a bit of a fail, um, but yeah, well noted.
we get the information with the grading you gave or you give between zero or let's say between one and five, right? And this is then getting up the color for the heat map. Yeah, exactly. What do you think we do with the descriptions? Well, it's, I guess here it would be more like when, if you have uh, something is gonna really start popping out, you, you then just literally gonna read the descriptions through. So the, the color just, sort of points you if you imagine this could be a very big matrix because you're going to have you know all of these fields on the x and the y axis is going to be very big and you're going to have something really you know shining out so that's where you're going to go and that's where you're going to i guess read the comments the question is more like you know what do you do with the lower grades that potentially hide big problems but we all fail to see them well let's say the community fails to see them so the idea in the end is actually we take both the star report, which is going to be made within these groups that are highly expert in, you know, in, in their fields, but then also combine it with this, which would hopefully be, you know, filled by a wider public. So it's going to be on all of us to push this to a widest possible audience. We're not going to be closing it after a year. This, this is going to be open until the end of the action. So we can also in year one see how the results may have changed through time also based on what we do throughout the action. Uh, yeah. And yeah, so why are we doing this in the first place? So we're looking for problems, but then in the next years to come, because we still have three and a half years, we're gonna target our funding, our STSMs, uh, you know, our resources into those fields. So also if we ever apply, or if you apply within yourselves to research projects like Horizon Europe, this would give you a good orientation on where the issues may lie. So, you know, you don't shoot into empty fields, but really target the ones we as a community, as an expert community, even a wider community thinks where the problems are. So this would kind of like steer the whole timber engineering field and where it needs to work. Because my personal fear is that, you know, with this timber construction increasing and increasing, we're going to see some big failures, which could then set the whole industry back. And this is what the concrete logic is just waiting for. So um, we should be one step ahead of the practice of the practice. So to prevent problems from happening on site, you know, one are the smaller issues like, you know, I can hear my neighbors snoring through the wall, but are there some bigger issues that could lie ahead? Uh, especially related to deterioration, to combinations of you know, seismic big loads and so on. So in the end, it may just turn out that all this huge matrix is just going to have like, you know, five things popping out. But in a way, that's also fine. We're just going to have to focus on those. Yeah, Latka. Uh, oh, Robert, Robert, sorry, yeah. So, yep, I agree. I agree. So, so also as far as your input goes, this is also so, something we should look at. So, let's say the list you have right now: you have architects, building physics, but they also then have lawyers, um, teachers, and so on. So, there is a list of profiles, and then let's say if you have unexperienced people, this should kind of like be a potential list to be here. So let's say people who technically don't may maybe have this direct expert connection to Timber, but maybe hold the key to some insight that we've all, you know, missed because we're so focused on our cancel mechanisms and stuff like that, we've missed the obvious. Um, so also these lists, the profiles are something we should take a look at. So if, if it's other, what is that other? And here, the current activity. So which field do you work in? So you work in acoustics, architecture, building and construction authority, building physics, construction management, insurance, regulatory compliance, research, structural design, teaching, testing, other, <laughs> um, and so on. So we know what we think. Right now, this group is great, but we're way too focused on just different. We're too much, there's too many engineers here, just honestly speaking. And what we wanted to have was really this wider crowd, because if you look at how many people get involved when the building is being made, 
it's a huge crowd of people. So they do not necessarily all have to have an expertise on timber, but they may have some information that we are completely missing. Also, like from the other end. So, you know, we know a lot about timber and some engineering details, but we are missing some other parts of the picture. So the, the main question was how to involve the widest possible entities, uh, widest possible spectral profiles to give their opinion on where problems with timber construction may lie. And this is so far the best what we were able to come up with. And all ideas to improve that are very, very welcome. So yeah, Robert also had something. Yeah, and then Maybe just to add, uh, I mean, we are very much dependent on uh, a lot of answers and a lot of problems that are pointed out. So it should be a bit like a mandatory for everyone to fill it out, uh, to contribute with a lot of ideas and comments, and maybe also to spread it to the local networks, yeah. uh, practice, or some other uh, uh, colleagues or um, stakeholders in the, in the field Absolutely. To, to also get the input. So for Gothenburg, we yeah. will check if you have filled it out. <laughs> Please, when you not, you have to uh, uh, yeah, give some comments there. So this is where this comes in. So basically, you're going to choose if you're a member of a war group or if you're not a member of any. So it would be good that there's still some of you who are not in the war groups, but just sort of at least for the sake of it, register where you belong. So we can then have, we could also put a separate field, so non-cost action member at all. Um, but yeah, it would be open to the public. Yeah, ready? I, I strongly suggest to do it uh, on a two-stage approach. Uh, the first stage approach is just collect information about who are the missing potential stakeholders not concerned, including occupants, for example, and the concepts that must be evaluated. And once you have this plethora of different concepts and stakeholders, then you can really ask us to vote and then you will have a frequency. Because if you do it on a one stage, uh, you will get all our energy drained in this other, 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 and then when you really know what is this other and how frequent it was, it would be difficult to come back to us. So I really recommend strongly to do it on two stages uh, to have a more uh, valuable. Uh, well noted. So I, I would be sharing this with you. Um, so you can fill both, let's say the first stage um, and then the second stage. So I think the stages are, they're not badly covered. I mean, the, the list is very extensive as we speak, but yeah, I agree. It, there is always more to add, more relevant fields. We may have missed quite a few. So the thing is, as far as the programming goes, we, let's say if we would now decide, okay, this is it, great, go ahead. We need about two weeks to get like completely finished, you know, bulletproof or cyber attacks, whatever. So I would then suggest that maybe we take two weeks for your suggestions, of course, you're all going to get this. It's all also recorded. Um, for the first stage, then also maybe two weeks for the second stage, and then we let's say launch in about six weeks or so. So that's one thing. I know I'm putting you on the spot now. It's hard to come up. Hey, no, I have a really good idea. I understand. It's it's not easy. Um, so keeping it complex enough, but then also simple enough to do it, you know, with one hand on on the phone. That's a really important part today. So um, the first idea was to just maybe have like a whole matrix on and you could just like click individual fields and put all come up in colors. That would just be a mess. You could do it maybe on the 4K screen, but not on the phone. So uh, it looks super silly and simple and stupid, but it's, it's really easy from the user perspective. So um, yeah, that is. Finding these buildings for users, yeah. Can we add some box with people that are living in here or using the buildings? Like, yeah. yeah, and and they can provide us comments uh, about some advantages, disadvantages, drawbacks, if they feel comfortable or, or non non comfortable. Would be yeah, that's a good, good point. Uh, yeah. Information for us. This would actually be more, I guess, for this exploitation phase so for the users if you see, see something is not working you know say i can hear my neighbor snoring execution phase maybe they don't know the reason why but at least they can put in some input yeah we have to think on how we're gonna exactly put that in but yeah the users are important i mean we're building buildings for <laughs> end users so okay if there, ah, yeah please
so the idea is that we're only allowed to fill once this uh no I, I guess it should be interesting to be able to choose more than one possibility of as many as possible <laughs> okay so, <laughs> so so somehow you when answering you will be able to add additional yeah. collision fields uh yeah so this is as far as collision fields go this would be the list and so far we just had other but like Shadi said we can also add more to this field to this list by default um and then if we really miss something there is always still the other option but if you imagine this being like a matrix that you're filling out feel as, as many as you feel comfortable so so all together there's if you do you know this is like i think 38 by 38 of course half of them are all duplicated so um, but there's quite some fields that you can theoretically feel. So, um, yep. Okay. Good. So, um, if there are no questions at this stage, we can then conclude with this part as well. So now the work group meeting start, and uh, they last for Think for two hours and then you're actually free from five o'clock onwards so dinner is at eight um and uh it's uh the taxis are going to be organized for those who wish to to come so we're going to start picking up here at about 15 to 8 or so so whoever is coming um and uh, now yeah sorry yeah seven uh, um, so yeah, 15 to seven, sorry. Um, and now you're splitting into groups. So it's, yeah. Thank you. Um, so group picture, if you have time, it's actually best if we maybe go to the, to the entrance. We also leave the people, uh, room now because they're going to set this room in one of the discussion halls. So we're going to, they're going to have to take out a few of the seats and put in the tables. So it's best if we leave them like for 10, 15 minutes, they can open. So to the main entrance, if you're all fine with that. So outside and close. Okay, so for everyone on, on Zoom and YouTube, we're going to be concluding the, the together part with that. Um, thank you for sticking with us for so long. And uh, hope to see you soon. So that's tomorrow when we have the wrap up of the meeting.